This is the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk to you about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today we have our fourth I Am a Hardscaper roundtable with three returning guests, an all-Canadian roundtable. We have Tony of Group Zamco. He is at Group Zamco on Instagram. That is group with an E at the end. Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Very welcome. Thank you for having me. And we've got Mike of Paver King at Paver King uh, at Paver underscore King on Instagram. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for returning. Thank you for strike card. No mercy, baby. <laughs> and we've got Jordan of DPR Landscapes. He is at DPR Landscapes on Instagram. Jordan, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back. So this is our unedited, unfiltered, uh, raw round table we'll see how that holds up with what comes out of mike's mouth here but uh <laughs> we'll see how this goes but i just want to get started here and get to know about you guys for 2021 because we just rounded we just put 2020 in our rear view and we're looking forward to 2021 so what goals have you guys got set up for 2021 whatever it might be whether it's just adding a piece of equipment looking for new hires whether you're you know planning on scaling up or adding new services such as deck building whatever it may be what do you have got and mike do you want to start us off there with, with that do you have any uh, new services planned uh sure yeah uh, well i don't know if we have new services planned we're uh, uh i think for you know, we're a new company, um, you know, technically we're only 18 months old, so we're going to focus on processes for 2021. We're going to focus on trying to make the lives of our uh, team better. I think that that should always be our number one focus. And I'm then looking at buying another uh, truck, so dump truck, but that's a big decision and it's a big, uh, big piece of equipment and a big purchase. So it takes a lot of thought and time, but those are sort of the, uh, we want to sort of, we have four streams of income now. We have snow with Jordan. We have uh, hard, uh, residential hardscaping. Uh, we have a commercial contracting division and obviously we have our um, excavating and haulage. So I think that uh, we're going to look to expand that in 2021. That's part of the business. We were successful with it this year. So we're going to try and grow that. Amazing. Nice. And we're not Jordan. any gaps. <laughs> and Jordan, over to yourself. Your your plans for 2021 goals you got set. Uh yeah. So I mean, quite a few, but uh, just just key things more on execution, not too much about growing. But um, we're looking to definitely create a better company culture, um, retain more employees, uh, but then more importantly, just become more profitable. Uh, not looking to grow the business as far as sales in an astronomical way, um, but more just looking to become more, more profitable, but in the same way, like, you know, we put systems into place where we're trying to track things a little bit more so that um, going back into new quotes and quoting new, new projects, I can look at them and I can go back to a previous job that was similar to it and say, you know, we missed on this, we hit on this, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, my partner, Derek, is going to be doing a lot more tracking this year um, and making sure that we're hitting our billable hours on each job um, and then that our budget as a result is more accurate. So that's, that's our main goal this year. It's just becoming more profitable um, and creating a company culture. Nice. Awesome. And over to you, Tony, goals for 2021 with Group Zamco. Uh, well, I mean, goals. Uh, luckily, our sales did extremely well this year. Uh, profit margins, too. So uh, we're basically just using that and taking that and bringing it into 2021. Um, as of right now, we're pretty much booked up for the entire 2021 season, which sounds great, but it's actually a, a problem, right? There's you don't want to be booked that far ahead. So uh, obviously it, it does give us the uh, possibility of adding crews uh, to our uh, company. Um, usually the problem is you want to add that crew, but you're not sure about the workload. We are blessed enough to have the workload. So now that's going to be the biggest obstacle of 2021 is to uh, expand um, into multiple crews. And uh, obviously we do want to, keep that social media going too. And that's going to be harder if I'm bouncing around a lot more. So it's, it's going to be an obstacle, but there's uh, there's some big goals, uh, which are going to come with a lot of work. <laughs> and speaking of social media, uh, you guys, 
uh, obviously are all on Instagram and you range from, you know, not doing a whole lot. And uh, I, I know Jordan, you talked to me about wanting to be more active on, on Instagram. So I want to talk to you about that as, and uh, Tony, I see you doing your stories with, with job sites and then all the way to Mike, who I see being the most active of the, the three of you guys there. So where does Instagram, where does social media fit in terms of your business? Is it a lead generation tool? Is it a just like a branding tool? Is it a just something for fun that you do? Like where where does Instagram, where does social media fit in terms of your business? And what is your plan for the future with your social media? If you want to expand more into being more active on it, if you want to, uh, you know, whatever it is you want to do with it, let, let's get your like two cents on social media in terms of your business and in terms of possibly growing your business. Jordan, do you want to kick things off here with what you say you want to do with it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, previously, I mean, I think I mentioned this in the first podcast that I had, but I had a previous business partner who was, he was more active on it. I mean, if you go back, you can see, you know, the amount of posts we posted in a year um, when I had my past business partner. Um, so definitely want to get back to that. But right now where I am at is struggling with where I want to take my social media page to want it to be more professional, to want it to be more contractor driven um, and where I want to take it. But ultimately way I'm leaning is I want it to be a social portfolio for our company um, and to more or less show off our work um, to, uh, you know, prospecting clients, um, but not as much, uh, you know, showing, showing our construction process, maybe. Um, it's just more or less acting as a, um, you know, a website in the same way. Like it's not, I don't anticipate it generating a ton of leads. Um, it's just because of the clients that I look to um, attract. However, my experience could be different than others. Um, right now, I feel like Facebook uh, just generationally is generating, would generate more leads than something like an Instagram would per se. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely want to get better at it because we've slacked um, to say the least. But uh just take it more in a portfolio uh, way in a more professional manner. Uh, th those are our goals. Definitely. And, and Tony, where do you see Instagram fitting into Group Zamco? Uh, is it is it a branding tool? Is it a tool to get to show off, uh, you know, projects in their construction to show what that looks like? Where, where does that all fit in terms of Group Zamco and where do you want it to fit moving forward? Well, for me, I mean, I, I guess social media is a bit of an all of the above uh, what you were saying, because it's but it's hard. It's hard to um, kind of tailor to all those aspects. Um, I find that I struggle making it more. I'm trying to make my social media a little bit more uh, personal. Right. Like my I find like my Instagram, it's doing, like, I mean, it's doing it's doing well, but it's not necessarily the type of page that is, it's not to maximize to what I want it to be. Uh, it's very much uh, contractor driven, right? There's uh, you see the company, you see the work. Um, but I want to add a bit more of a soul to the, um, to the account, I guess you could say a bit more of a personality to it that it's lacking right now. So that's definitely going to be what I'm looking uh, towards. And um, I actually just posted a story that uh it was a project from the beginning of the season that never ended up happening. Uh, but I definitely did want to start a YouTube channel uh, to help contractors or just, you know, get some basically film what we're doing on site and having all that video might help create a bit of content. So I'm going to tie all of that in together. So I'm not sure exactly where our social media is going to go this year, but it's definitely got to get uh, bigger than it is. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you, like have fun with it right i think that's a big part it's mm -hmm. it's definitely a sales tool don't get me wrong it's a sales tool it's a way to put your your projects out there and show people what you're capable of uh, also it gives you credibility because if you're not scared to show your process uh it means you're not cutting corners right now if you're going to do it that one time for the camera and then don't do it again that's obviously you're not getting anywhere but i feel like um explaining something to the homeowners and telling them i do it this way versus my competitors if uh, 
they're finding you on Instagram or whatever social platform you use, chances are they follow you. If they follow you, they've already seen all this stuff. So when you're telling them, this is how I'm building it, they've already seen you do it. So I'm kind of, I want to put more educational stuff out there, not necessarily uh, just for contractors, but for homeowners too, because they're very interested in it. We take it for granted, but they're interested in seeing it. This is not stuff they see every day, you know? So that's, that's what I'm planning to do with it. Definitely. Definitely. And then over to you, Mike, obviously I would say out of the three of you guys, you'd be the one that invests the most time in terms of uh, consistently, at least putting out stories. Uh, it, what does that mean to your business in Paver King and moving forward and in terms like, where do you see that building your business in what aspects? I think that we're in a unique position because I think that, um, you know, it's my experience that every other uh, hardscape company on Instagram, their Instagram account is named after their company. And I think we're probably the only company that's named after our Instagram account. You know, and that's brand. true. Like, oh, I mean, if you want to talk about how important it is to our company, it's literally like our company is named after our Instagram account. So uh, I think it, I, it's a deep question for me because I struggle with it a lot. Um, you know, I think that I spend the majority of our time um, doing things that I find amusing or funny. And I don't know that that drives any kind of sales or, um, you know, I, we did, <laughs> And recently, Nancy uh, Green and I finished a Zoom call with a client, and literally the client ended the, the Zoom call by, like, like himself and his wife, you know, yelling into the camera, fuck decks, build patios. So, you know, and I was like, and I was honestly, I was in a state of shock. I was like, oh, man. And I was like, oh, you know. And I said to him, you know, sometimes I do stuff on there that's probably not great for clientele. And he's like, no, it's awesome, and I love it. And I was like, well, you know, if if 90% of the people tune in and they don't like us and 10% do, then I'll take the 10% that do. And, uh, and, you know, they're probably not going somewhere else. Um, as far as this year coming up, I, I have a, I've struggled with whether or not we should, you know, there's a lot of people that DM me for like experience questions or, um, you know, how to run their business or something. And I, I don't ever know that I'm the person for that or it makes me feel uncomfortable. So I, I don't know if we'll ever be that. You know, I think there's a lot of places to learn how to install papers. I don't think anyone needs my opinion on it. Um, so I think we'll probably just maintain the sort of status quo and us having a good time and enjoying what we do for a living. You know, I think that our all of our team enjoys being a part of it. They enjoy that. You know, every, I think they all enjoy the rush of getting to be parts of different things. And you know, some of our weird skid steer safety videos got fifty thousand views this year. And um, you know, the guys that the, the people that were in them were excited. Uh, you know, recently Christy got featured with the Toolaholic, um, which, you know, that was, she was super excited about it. So uh, I think they will just use it more of a team building thing. And uh, if we get some leads from it, that's fantastic. Uh, we, we're, 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 you know, four old guys in Lucas. We don't, I don't need a lot of leads to drive the business forward. So. You know, it's, I don't think we'll ever do with that. It's always just been sort of a stress relief for me and a hobby. So we'll probably keep it the same. Unless everyone's super disappointed by it and doesn't want to tune in and then maybe we'll change it. But, you know, everyone seems to be losing followers lately. So maybe when I lose 5,000 followers, we'll alter it. <laughs> So speaking of which, that does bring into our into play our first Instagram question from DTE Landscaping Co. And he wants more Skid Steer Safety Series videos, Favor King. So how many more can we expect uh, coming up here? Uh, I don't know. Lucas went skiing. So, you know, without Lucas, I, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I, I think that the struggle is that there's something that will occur to me that's funny and then it won't occur to me again for a while. So. I don't know, I'd like to keep the series going. I think it was fun. I think everyone enjoyed it. So we'll probably, you know, we were on 13. I feel like we should all start for 20, you know, set some, maybe we'll start for 21 because it's, you know, 2021. So we'll start for 21 safety. There you go. Yes, it's hard not to do, just do the same thing over and over again. Though. So there's only so many ways to kill yourself with a skid steer. There's so many ways to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but we will, we'll make a comeback for sure. Uh, so some of you guys mentioned employees since we've talked, uh, Paver King, you mentioned, uh, you know, four old guys and, and Lucas and, 
And I know you guys have built teams around you to, and, and you, let's talk about hiring. Let's talk about bringing on these employees and how do you keep them on? Because obviously with the labor shortage, it's not just about trying to get volume in. It's about trying to get the right ones in that you can groom, that you can, you know, make sure that they're hitting what they want to hit in terms of goals in their life and keeping them loyal. So what does that mean to you in your business? Um, let, let's start with hiring. Where do you look for hires if you're looking for one? How do you get them into your business? What are some uh, things to look for in a new hire coming into your business? So where do you look and what are you looking for in that next hire? Tony, you mentioned you might be adding a new team this year. Where would you start and what would you look for in terms of getting that team organized? Uh, well, I've been very lucky in the sense that um, I've grown my team within my team. Um, it's a lot of my own uh, employees that actually find me new employees. Uh, they don't all work out, obviously, but um, I have a, I have a, a young team, right? So we're um, the benefit is that a lot of these guys are, um, you know, they're not like they don't necessarily all have families yet and all that. So they have a lot of free time and they're, they're trying to figure out what they want to do with their, their careers also. So I, I one kind of policy I've had since the beginning um, and some people disagree. Some people agree is I don't necessarily want the guy that has experience. I have my experience guys. I don't want to bring in somebody who's set in their ways. So to say uh, I like, taking people that don't have experience in the field, but do have experience with uh, manual labor that understand that this is a physical job and holding them and, and creating the type of experienced worker that I need for the type of projects that I do and the type of meticulousness and all that. Um, so it really comes down to that. I, I try to keep um, my eyes open all the time. When people and I tell my guys like, you know, just we could always take on another guy. We could always, like, if, if you know anyone that's looking for work, let's not lose that opportunity. Bring them in. Even if we have one guy too many for the, the two days or so, uh, if they don't work out, at least we know they don't work out. But if they work out, then I'll find a job for them. I'll find something for them to do. And, um, I mean, we started the season with four employees, and we finished the season with 12. So, and I mean, this was like, not necessarily because I needed 12. I probably needed nine by the end of the season. We had 12 because I said, let me bring in as many guys as I can by the end of the season and kind of recruit for the following year. So that's how I did it. So I know going into next season, I have 12 prospects, right? So that, that's, I mean, it's not necessarily a trick that works for everyone, but for me, it, it's worked out pretty well so far. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you... Um... You mentioned that you might be looking at another dump truck, which would mean another employee to be able to drive that dump truck. Also, so also with uh, bringing more people in, where would you look for them? How, who would you be looking for in terms of bringing them in? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so for me on a personal level, hiring some, I mean, everyone that works with us currently, um, would have different opinions. I would defend my position. Other people would say I stole them, but they all came from a previous employer, every one of them. Minus um, Kaz has been my friend since uh, 1988, and Brian uh, I've known for 10 or 12 years. So those are two. But the, the, the core of our team all comes from a previous employer. Uh, they all approached me. I didn't approach them, for the record. Uh, but uh, if for me, hiring someone new is intimidating because I haven't, haven't brought someone in that wasn't part of something already that I didn't know. Uh, so I, I feel like we're, I mean, I honestly, my biggest deterrent to buying a truck is who's going to drive it. You know, um, that's, I mean, I, I know I could keep it busy hundred percent. I have no doubt I can keep it busy. Um, I have no doubt that we have a formula that, um, earns money with the dump truck. Uh, but having someone drive it, that's where, it, cause I don't, you can't replace Christy. Um, I can't replace any of them, anyone on our team. So, you know, hiring someone new is scary. I don't know exactly how we're going to do it. We've, we've been having discussions about it in the office. I know that our residential business is getting busier. And as opposed to um, hiring someone, uh, I found someone that I trusted a lot 
to um, we're going to try them out on the job as a you know as a subcontractor working under our umbrella, sort of under the Paver King Collective. Jordan has done that kind of stuff um, for me, where he's come in sort of under our umbrella and he's helped us with projects, and we've had a lot of success. Part of that's because it's Jordan, and he's just amazing, and so is Derek. Both of them. Jordan gets a lot of the headroom, but you know Derek is there every day grinding it out. So uh, you know the two of them have have been amazing for us whenever we've called on them. So uh, the success we've had there, I think that in terms of the residential business, we'll probably more than likely expand that way because I would rather pay um, highly qualified, skilled people that I can trust more than try to train someone. I'm almost 50 years old. Like I just, you know, for me, it's, I'll, I'll give some points off the top so that um, we have good people doing the work. Um, but that, I don't, I don't know how we're going to hire people yet. I'm working on it. I have hired a many, many people in the past, hundreds of people I've hired in the past, right to the point where I've just literally said, do you have any friends? Can you bring them along? Um, I have hired people that that's how Lucas got his job. When we were at our previous employer, I said to someone I hired, you got any friends? Can you bring them along? And Lucas got out of the car and I was like, sweet, another guy showed up today. Awesome. Uh, you know, so I, I, I well, we're working on it. But, I mean, I know Jordan has a lot better systems than I do, so he can probably testify better to how to find people. So, Jordan, what what goes into finding somebody? <laughs> I know that you you partnered with uh, Derek, was so that that kind of spreads out the load a little bit. But in terms of filling those in those spots where you need employees, where do you look? How do you get them? Yeah, I mean, um, just to touch quickly first on what Tony said, I mean, I think that is a great way of doing things. I mean, when I worked at the previous company like Red Rose, um, essentially, we had our entire hockey team working there, um, which was which was awesome. Like that, that like we we're all buddies. We all worked hard. Like we're hockey players. Hockey players work hard. Um, so I think that's a great system. I'm just waiting to find that right guy in this day and age that, you know, you hire a 21 year old right now, they're, they're totally different beasts than they were, you know, seven years ago. Um, but, and that being said, I mean, uh, it's in terms of finding employees. I mean, we, we do postings, we do postings on Facebook, we do postings on Indeed, we do postings on Kijiji. Uh, hasn't been the best experience to be completely honest. I'm still trying to build my team. Um, I struggled a lot last year. Uh, I went through five employees. Uh, I finished the season with myself, Derek and one employee. Um, and we were doing, you know, $60,000 jobs, just the three of us. Um, so it was fine. It was the end of the season. All the work was booked. It was all good but obviously not the direction we're looking to take things. Um, so this year, you know, um, I'm going back to, you know, hiring a couple of guys that have worked for me before um, and then kind of seeing how that goes. And then again, uh, trying to hire some more people off posting. So um, definitely, I mean, I've gone that route that Tony went where he went to hire people that had labor experience and less of experience in the trade per se um however they didn't all didn't work out those were the five guys or four four of the five guys that i went through last year um were the guys that i hired that had labor experience seemed like they were young willing to work hard so on and so forth but you know they found jobs in factories and figured working in a factory would be nice and then working outdoors and working 100 hours every two weeks and you know getting paid on a salary during the winter um to me it really doesn't seem like a hard or a bad job. Um, but it's just finding that person, of course, uh, you know, what we have put in place is, you know, code of conducts, obviously with our employees, um, but then incentive programs, obviously. Uh, so, you know, we set out progress tracking sheets and performance tracking sheets for our employees the day we hire them. Um, we review those tracking sheets when they get hired in one month um, and we assess what their wage is. So we start them at you know, let's say 20 bucks an hour, uh, that employee in their head maybe thinks they're worth 22, 24. We said, okay, sounds good. We'll start you at 20 because I've been through it where people have said they can do more than they can actually do. Um, 
And then, you know, they show the initiative and they come in and work hard and show a good attitude. Those are my three major, major, major things. I don't care if you can make rock cuts or do all the intricate stuff. It's a good attitude. It's a work ethic and it's showing up every single day uh, with no excuses. So we assess that after four weeks. Um, if, you know, they're showing everything that we've asked from them, we set out goals for them. They meet every single one of those goals. We give them a race. From there on, we do meetings every two months. Um, again, like I said, didn't work out for me last year where, you know, we're looking to progress people, you know, a dollar or two, um, every two months per se. Um, and it didn't really work out. And then we also put in a program, uh, the one employee that stuck around, he now has health benefits. Uh, so we gave him benefits after you're with us for one year, we give you benefits. And after you're with us for three years, we're going to put you in on an RSP plan, uh, and we'll match your contributions up to a maximum of 3%. Um, so those are the kind of things that we're trying to put in place to get reoccurring employees so that we can get to the stage where we can grow to multiple crews. Um, however, at this point, honestly, my main goals are, you know, retaining employees, getting a good crew, um, maximizing our profits, and then we'll start working on building into other crews. Um, because really, I don't see the point of working twice as hard myself for the exact same amount of profits for 10 guys opposed to four to five right so that that's where we're at right now um long way to go uh it hasn't necessarily worked out for us yet uh still trying to stay optimistic but and then you know this year i hope to retain more employees and keep keep building our business right yeah and that's my next question is what what benefits do you guys try to offer to increase that that retainment whether it is you know health benefits the rsp uh, contribution matching any any like additional time off like do you guys try to think outside the box in terms of these benefits that you can offer your employees to retain them jordan anything else like in terms of thinking outside the box other than you know the health benefits and rsp matching which is huge definitely but anything else that you're thinking outside of the box in the future you might implement to help retain these employees um, I mean, I think those are two like great incentives. Um, it's finding the right people that will wrap their heads around the fact that in an eight month season, they're almost working a full year on what everyone else is working. If someone's working a 40 hour week and this guy's working a 50 hour week every two weeks. Um, yeah, he's getting probably taxed you know, heavy. Um, he's all going to, he's going to get those taxes back at the end of the year. And then two, um, we offer salary during the winter. So I got, you know, me and Derek, obviously that's irrelevant, but, um, we got one employee, he's on salary. Um, in whippy here, I mean, Mike can attest to it. I mean, we've hardly had to go out and snowplow this year. Um, so he's getting paid to sit at home right now to, you know, do nothing. Um, he can, he can do whatever he wants. He can work on the side. He can find himself some other work. Obviously he's not getting paid $50 an hour, but he's getting a reasonable, uh, salary for the amount of work that he's completing. Um, so for me, it's just showing people those benefits that, you know, you can work outside, you can work hard. You're going to work hard for seven, eight months of the year. And then four to, um, five months of the year, you're, you're going to have a lot of free time to do the things that you didn't get to do. Um, obviously, I mean, I'm pretty flexible and pretty lenient with my employees. As long as they give me the notice, I honestly only ask for a week's notice. Give me a week's notice. You got a doctor's appointment. You, you know, you're going away for a long weekend or something like that. Just let me know. I'll give you that day off, but I just want a week's notice. I don't want to know about it two to three days before, or you're not getting the day off. I mean, I plan my weeks by week by week. Right. Uh, and even more than that, but if I have a week, uh, to, to make adjustments and to even let clients know, because obviously on a weekly basis, I'm touching base with clients in the, in the future to let them know, you know, Hey, we're going to be on your job in you know, a week and a half or a week or so on and so forth, pending weather. Um, I need to be able to plan for that. So I'm pretty lenient, but, um, I, I think honestly, the programs that we set in place should be enough to retain employees unless someone else has some really creative ideas. I'd love to hear them. Tony, over to you. Any benefits that you have in place right now, thinking about having in place benefits outside of the box uh, beyond anything that you've already heard uh, that you are implementing in your business for your employees to retain them? 
Well, um, I think Jordan's doing a great job. Uh, he definitely has more in place than I do. <laughs> Um, I've tried the medical benefits route. Unfortunately, I was told that it's not possible for us because we're seasonal. Um, so, I mean, I I've, I've have to look into it again. And I usually use the winters to look into that stuff, have a bit more time. But, um, yeah, that's something I definitely want to implement. And I just I wasn't able to get it done. Um, then aside from that, I mean, I just I gotta put, I, I treat my guys really well. Um, I've been really good with retention, so I haven't really had to venture into uh, ways of, of uh, enhancing it. But again, that's really lucky because I know that's not the norm. And I've had, you know, I, I've had main guys just up and leave and tell me, you know what, on Monday I got offered this amount. On Monday I'm leaving, which I find is one of the like the cl most classless things that you could do um, because you. Like I, you always, you never want to burn your bridges, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been lucky that I've had a lot of loyalty along the way. Um, you know, for every one unloyal person, I've had three loyal uh, employees. Uh, but it's kind of, it's just a very um, family feel uh, for our crew. So, it, you know, people don't even sh come in late or, or take days off really, unless they absolutely have to, because they, it's not about them or they're not worried about their pay for that day. They're worried about the, the crew that the guys are letting down because they're not there. So, um, and again, I can't even give advice for that because it's not something that I specifically did other than just create a culture that um, they don't want to let down their coworkers, which is cool. I mean, it works out great for me, um, but it's basically that these guys, I mean, some of these guys I, are, are now that it's off season, obviously they don't work together, but they still hang out all the time and they didn't know each other at the beginning of the year. So it's really because it becomes a family. So I think that's what has helped me retain. Uh, obviously, I pay my guys well as well, uh, but that goes without saying in anything. It's um, every employee obviously does want to get paid more. But I, I feel like, you know, they can get offered more from other companies and stay with me because other companies would have to offer them a lot more to even entice them to leave. But they still stay because they say, you know, like I've worked other places. It's not like here. So I think as long as I keep that, you know, vision and, and understand, um, I just don't forget that uh, the employees have to enjoy where they work to want to keep working for you. And then, you, you know, you don't have to work so hard to keep them because I think we have enough to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis that we don't have to worry about how to pamper our employees, even though we do need to appreciate them. And I do appreciate them, but I, I'm not going to invest more time than I have to pampering them when uh, I feel like I give them everything that they need to maximize their career. You know, it's not a job, it's a career. I always say that. This is not a job. If you want a job, there's a million companies out there that own quick cuts and pickups and all that stuff. Uh, if you want to build a career, I'll build a career for you. You will earn the salary based on uh, your knowledge, but I will give you that knowledge. You know, unfortunately, then there are people that will take that knowledge somewhere else and get paid well for it. Um, but I'm not too concerned with that because of the culture we've created. And then yourself, Mike, benefits that you have in place are thinking about putting in place anything outside of the box that you do. Uh, I think, you know, I've been managing people for, I don't know, 25 years. Um, uh, in all different ways. I think that the one thing you have to do if you want to retain employees is find out what's important to them. You know, you can put as many programs in place as you want. If it's not a program that's particularly important to any of your people, it's not going to matter. Um, and sometimes that's individual, like, you know, we have um, three team members that work directly for Favor King and I could tell you, I wouldn't tell you on here, but I can tell you what I, I know what's important to every one of those um, team members. And then we make sure that those are things that we, we do for them because they all have different things that they need done in their lives and different things that are important to them. Um, and we make, you know, Kelly, uh, my wife who runs our office, um, she makes sure that every one of them is getting the things that they need on different levels. You know, that's hard to um, say scale. I don't know how you'd scale that. Uh, but I have, even when I was managing a company where there's 15 employees, you know, one of the endless things in landscaping is I don't have a driver's license for whatever reason, um, possibly drinking, maybe. But, you know, there could be other reasons why you don't have a license. I just have never encountered them. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that was important in that setting where there was 15 of them was that you know a lot of them didn't know how to get to work so 
you know, we gave the foreman trucks, we ran them up and down the main road in Durham Highway 2, and we picked everyone up for work and we dropped them all off. Uh, and we retained a lot of employees because they wouldn't leave for a dollar or two dollars because they're like, oh, if I leave, how am I getting to work? How am I going to get there? Um, I think that, you know, it sounds bad when I say this, but, you know, you have to make people in a, in a, in a sense, you need to make people addicted to working for you, which it sounds bad when you're using the word addiction, but I'm talking, it could be in a good way. It could be because you're, re- you know, one of the things that we recognize currently um, is that, you know, we travel a lot for work. Um, our biggest client is a commercial client who takes work anywhere, like literally like Stony Creek and we're in like, Oshawa. So, um, you know, one of the things we do is we offset that traveling time. We give uh, every uh, employee gets $20 a day for traveling. You know, now sometimes they win. Like we do lots of work that's five minutes from our house um, and they win. And I'm happy when they win. I'm glad when they win. And sometimes they lose a little bit. Um, you know, it doesn't match their hourly wage. We're traveling for more than, like, you know, um, but we find that at least it's an offset. It's an effort that we're making to save and we understand your issue. We understand your problem. And we're trying to offset it. We um, we purchased, you know, we had, we did, uh, we purchased boots for uh, one of our team last year. And, um, you know, they ended up with, you know, $50 boots from Walmart. So this year, Kelly just emailed them all the Blundstone website and said, pick your boots. And we bought them good high quality boots that would last the season and um you can see the posture change i mean um, you know just in people having the ability to have very good boots we buy um we buy them the cool works pants with the uh, shorts on the bottom first of all they're safer they're reflective and they're just safer on the job so, i mean these pants are a hundred dollar per per team member investment this is not, you know, it's a hundred bucks, I mean, but to them, they're not having to pay for their own pants. So, you know, like whatever. So we have like $300 per team member invested in pants. Like, I don't you know, whatever. It's even small things. Like when we were buying, uh, you know, some company shirts to wear on the job site, you know, we asked Christy, what, what do you want to wear? Like you drive the truck, what do you want? I'm not, you know, just going to buy a shirt and say, hey. and so she picked out tank tops that she wore. And small things like that make a big difference. We did. Um, look deeply into um, having a benefit package for our, our team. Uh, it didn't pan out this year. Um, you know, this year was a, for us, was a bit of a cash flow struggle year. So, um, you know, it just didn't pan out this year, but in the spring, we'll certainly be revisiting it. And uh, I think we'll, I'm confident we'll be able to offer it. It's also only, it's only our second year. So um, we had some growing pains and some struggles, but I, I think that, you know, the number one thing I would say to anyone is you just, you honestly, you have to find out what's important to the people. You can offer anything. It doesn't matter if they don't want it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, Mike, honestly, I think that that's like a big thing. You put it the best out of all of us. It's There is no perfect plan. Like you said, there's no specific plan that will work for everybody. So it's literally that. Just know your guys and find out what they like. So, yeah, I, th- I think that was like that was an awesome way to put it keep them happy with what makes them happy and not just what would generally make an employee happy. And what, what makes me happy as a person doesn't necessarily make them happy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's a a vast difference. I I think the other thing that, I mean, I, if anyone who follows our account, they know that um, I work every day. I do not like being in the office. I have no use for it. I don't like it. I find no self value or self worth from it. And, you know, one of the things that I think that our particular um, long-term team members probably appreciate me as I would never ask them to do something that I haven't done myself or wouldn't do in the moment. Um, I get up earlier than them. I'm ready for work. Or like, And that's just me. And I'm not saying that's right for everyone's business because everyone has different growth goals. And I, I also understand that our business perhaps suffers because I tend, you know, would prefer to shovel than to um, dive into business growth seminars. Um, but, you know, I think that that's something that the team and the people that we attract appreciate is that I'm with them every day doing stuff. Um, so that's one thing I know that um, our people know that I'm, I'm going to be there or if they call me, I answer my phone. If they're working, I'm working. Mm-hmm. I don't For sure. I make sure that I'm available. Like, you know, even if Christy's out by herself on Saturday floating equipment and she's the only one working, my phone's on and I'm probably in the office doing the office work I've procrastinated and neglected, but she knows if she picks up that phone and calls me, I will come wherever she is and, um, and help her or any of them. But. No, it's exactly that. You're, you know, um, I find that in any business, not just in our industry, but in every business, 
the employees have a high tendency of feeling like um, without them, uh, you know, you wouldn't survive. And it's not a bad thing. It, it means that, you know, they take pride in what they do and they, they think that they're very good at it and they usually are very good at it. But if you're right there next to them doing it, they know that, look, if you leave tomorrow, you know, I'll get down on my knees and I'll pull great. I can, you know, and not to say that you have to do it. And luckily, like I know my guys, if they see me carrying pavers, they're going to come and take them out of my hands because they're like, yo, you don't have to. But they appreciate that I will. You know, the lighting, I install all my lights. I love it. Now, I've, delega- I've started delegating because I have to. You know, I was doing too much. And what happens is that they become too dependent on you. And not just that, but like they didn't know how to install the lights and all that. So I said, you know what? Just follow me and do stupid things. Like you're paying a guy to literally, you you know, you're coring and he's just hammering in a light, which is, it takes me two seconds. I don't need to pay a guy to stand there while I'm coring for him to do it, but he's watching me core. And then when I go and install a light or attach a wire, I turn around and he has the drill and he's coring, right? So like they, they, they see you doing it. And it's also like a learning, a teaching opportunity, which is great. But yeah, definitely being hands-on in the field is, uh, it's like um, I always said, you know, this business, uh, I've said this from the beginning is I'm working to support a family, but I'm building the business for my family, for my children. And, uh, you know, they're young now, but when they start working with me, they're doing wheelbarrows. They're doing like the worst parts of the job, wheelbarrow, shovels, all that. Why? Because they're going to be bosses one day. They're going to run crews one day. They're going to be the bosses. And you can't respect a boss that won't get his hands dirty. You can't re- you, and a boss can't respect an employee if they haven't done what they're asking that employee to do. So I think Mike put it best that um, you're not asking them to do anything you haven't done or that you won't do right now at this second if you had to. So I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's two things that came from all that that I want to cover. One being identifying those goals with your employees. Do you guys have a structure in the way that you do that? Do you have just like a, do your employees just know that they can come to you with anything? Or is this something that you schedule out and you say, uh, twice a year or once a year, we're going to just sit down and we're going to, you know, see where you're at in your life. We're going to see what goals you want to achieve at a certain point in time in this coming year, uh, and how I can best serve you. Uh, what does that look like in your business? Mike, you did bring this up in terms of goals and knowing what your employees need. What does that look like for you? Do your employees know that they're yeah that you're an open book uh, anytime that they want to come to you and, no, and tell you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go go ahead. So, like, what what does that look like for you? Do you do you have a structured time that you meet with them, or do you always kind uh, of? So we had a like you know, um, Christy started in October last year, so October this year. You know, we, I had a. a conversation with her we're you know just reviewing her year and and how we planned on moving forward and what she liked and what she didn't and um you know we do that we i did that with uh with jay in the spring and i did it with lucas um when he would you know he was stuck in british columbia for a good part of the season because of the um covid i i do definitely review with them and i think that because i spend a lot of time with all of them i you know i talk to them and you know they'll drop hints about things that you know, just important in their lives. And we try to work towards those things. Um, you know, and Kelly will visit the site. Um, she's been trying to get out of the office and visit the site. She worked with the guys for, I don't know if any of you caught it, but she actually worked on site with the guys for a full job start to finish, a three week project that we did. Um, you know, she learned a lot about hardscaping in general and then a lot about um, all the people on the team. So I think that it gives them, you know, sometimes I can be, uh, you know, knowing yourself and being self-aware, I can be harsh and mean to people. Um, not, in, you know, like, well, I would like to say not intentionally, but I can say 100% it's just intentional, it just comes out. Um, so I think it, having Kelly around has really helped our business in terms of giving them someone they can call, someone they can talk to. Uh, even some of our um, subcontractors like Kaz and Brian, they can, they call Kelly, they can talk to her. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think it, 
our company's small. I don't want it to be any, you know, I don't want it to be, you know, it's bigger now than I ever wanted it to be when I started it. So, um, you know, I think that we just, we need to manage our people in a different way too. Our people are all older. They have different things going on. So, um, you know, in terms of what's important, like we, I talk to them a lot. I know them all personally. I put in a lot. And even when I managed a crew, of, you know, crews of 15 people, I spent a lot of time with all of them trying to get to know them and know what was important to them and trying to, I mean, I think that trying to help people better their lives and whether they leave or not, or they go on, they're always going to be successful. And I think that, I mean, I, I can guarantee you can bump into quite a few people that will tell you I didn't help them better their lives, but I'd like to think there's at least a percentage of people who said that bumping into me did help them better their lives. And that's why they stuck around. They thought that there was someone watching out for them or taking care of them. I, like in this business, there's a lot of, like, and I say this from a, a place of, you know, I'm not throwing stones from my glass house, but there's a lot of broken people in this business, me being one of them. I've been broken and shattered a million times and then put myself back together with the help of the people. Um, in this industry. So like, if you can find people that are um, in need of help and help them, then those people will be loyal and they'll stay with you for a really long time. And sometimes you have to put up with a lot of like <laughs> crap at the start, you know, to see them through some things um, and see them, you know, some of the, I mean, and there's people all over the place. I see that, you know, I, when I met them, they were pretty broken and now they're, they're leading decent lives and they're, they've gotten their stuff together and, uh, you know, we've all crawled out of a hole. So you know, having respect for someone and helping them with that, they're definitely going to be more loyal and stick around. And that's what we try to do. We try to make sure that everyone's, you know, getting where they need to be, wherever that is. I don't, you know, it doesn't have to be. I think that sometimes as a business owner, people get it in their head, they get blinders on that you have a vision for the people that are working on your team and you want them to go a certain direction and be a certain way. And if that's not the way they want to go, I think that that's going to be a short term relationship. So, you have to people for who they are and the direction they want to take and then try to incorporate that into your um into your business mm -hmm. uh jordan yourself so do I'm, you I'm done. yeah <laughs> jordan yourself uh in terms of i was a long time, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I nothing more to say like, i can't respect tony's pg water though like that's all right there that guy's not messing around. I bet he doesn't have that. I bet he bought that PG water just so he could drink it. No, this was what I needed. <laughs> <I'm falling laughs> this, this is the client water. <laughs> this is the this is why I'm charging you that much. Smell <laughs> <laughs> the water, baby. I can respect that. Though. I'm <laughs> actually this is a sponsorship. Fiji. It's <laughs> rectangular. <laughs> I have a whole water thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, jo Go ahead. Yeah, Jordan, yourself with the, in terms of knowing your employees' goals, and especially your partner, uh, with your partnership, your partner's goals, and that they align with the business. Do you have set times where you sit down and you kind of have a structured talk in terms of finding these things out? Uh, yeah, so definitely have said, like I kind of mentioned before, you know, we try to do performance reviews with the employees that actually stick around. Um, but performance reviews every two months, if not, like we don't get a chance or, you know, schedules conflict every three months at the absolute minimum. Um, and on our, it's a formal thing. It's written out, you know, I have goals for them to achieve during that period. And then I ask them, what are their goals to achieve too? Um, you know, mainly, you know, the response I've gotten from people are, you know, the goals that are, you know, related to the business and related to working, you know, I want to learn this, I want to learn that, which ultimately leads to them earning more money. Um, but, you know, I think Mike brought up a great point about, you know, just really seeing what works for their, like for that individual, um, what, what they strive for, what motivates them. Uh, Cause again, different things motivate different people. Uh, so yeah, we do have a, we do have a set schedule on meeting with people. Um, we're still trying to refine it, trying to make sure that it's the right thing to do. I'm not saying it is, you know, we just put it in place last year. It's not something I've been doing for years. Uh, so we just put it in place last year. So I'm still trying to figure it out, find the right employees that it works for. Um, but then obviously, you know, talking with, you know, you guys, um, you know, there's always room for improvement and seeing, you know, it doesn't have to be so structured. It could be a little bit more casual. Uh, that being said, you know, having Derek on site every single day, someone that I can talk to at a business level and there's, you know, 
it's very personable, very business manner. Um, you know, we talk and he, he's with those people every single day. So he learns a lot about those people. Um, so he learns what their motivations are and what they're looking to do and speaks to them, you know, as a, as a mem- like a team member rather than a, uh, than a boss. Right. Uh, for myself, when I go on site, honestly, I try to be the fun guy when I'm on site, like I'm the joker, I'm fun. Um, because for the most part, I'm always having to be the, the guy that's cracking down on some things here, there, and the, or the other. Um, but when I get on site, I try to have fun, try to show them that it can be a light, fun experience. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, I know Derek too. So, uh, knowing what he wants, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. I mean, I've known him for a long time. So if something pisses him off, I know I piss him off. Um, it's pretty clear. Um, so he doesn't hide anything. So, um, or he's pissed me off. I don't hide, I don't hide it from him either. You know, I I'm comfortable talking with him and that's what makes our partnership great is that we don't bottle those things up and, you know, we, we get them out in the open and we find resolutions. Um, so yeah, that, that's how we deal with those things. Gotcha. And then yourself, Tony, any, any goal setting with employees, sit downs, anything formal, anything structured in terms of this is when we do it, or what does that look like in terms of goal setting within your business? Uh, I wouldn't say we have any specific structure because, you know, like Mike said, everyone has their own uh, needs Their Everyone has their own goals. Uh, so I wouldn't say that we have a specific structure. Uh, all I care about is long-term goals, really. Like, obviously, there's always the short term, but that just comes as a day-to-day, you know. And my guys that tell me, like, hey, uh, could I, you know, you mind if I do some cuts? Do you mind if I start cutting a bit? For sure. And we don't have, a, a, like, a formal, tell me what you want and let me find out, which maybe we should. That would, might work out a lot. I'll definitely try that this year and see. Um, because I, I do have, I am guilty of, being very busy so i'm on the job all the time um but i do find that i'm always running around i'm always like my head's in a million places um so it would be good to when i'm not on the job outside of uh, the regular work there or you know lunch break or whatever after work ask them like tell me if there's specific things you want to do specific things you want to learn that way when i'm on the job i could be wary of that that would probably be uh, very beneficial um, but no, I, I care about long-term goals. I'll ask my guys often, you know, like, you know, what, what is it that you're trying to get out of this in general? Not specifically right now, but the guy says, oh, you know, like I, I'm going back to school in September. Like I'm not going to invest a lot of time and energy into that employee. I will, I'll treat him the same as everybody else, right? I, I appreciate that he's working for me at that time, but I'm going to invest my time and energy to somebody who wants to build a career. Because I'm very adamant on this is not a job. This is a career. If you want a job, I will give you one. But let's be straight with each other. Let's call it what it is. It's a job. If you want a career, I will give you every single tool you need to build a career, to be the best hardscaper you could be. If you up and leave one day because you outgrown uh, an employee position or, or a team leader position, then, you know, whatever. It's, it's all part of the part of the trade it's all it's all part of training people and building them up is eventually you know it's like raising your kids you raise them and one day they leave the house to live their own lives you don't want a home all the time you want employees to stay with you forever <laughs> but you know that's not the world we live in so it's long-term goals that i care about if you are willing to put in the effort i will give you everything at my disposal to make you the best that what uh, you are the best version of yourself definitely if somebody asks you, what is DPR, DPR Landscape's culture? What is Paver King's culture? What is Group Zamco's culture? Have you guys thought about this? Is this something that you spend a lot of time on in terms of thinking about that and implementing that? Or is this something that comes naturally? So Jordan, what is DPR Landscape's culture? What, have, is, have you thought about this? Is this something you think about? Is this something that's implemented? Yeah, so I mean, um... One thing, you know, Tony mentioned, um, it's showing people that you can create a career out of this. Uh, You know, 
in my opinion, if a foreman, uh, if you have a foreman and he's running his own sites, like he should be making $40 an hour minimum, uh, 35, 40, whatever it is, um, depends on what your business is, but, um, you can make a career out of this. So $40 an hour, you have to be able to complete with, you know, trades like electrical or plumbing, um, things like that. You have to be able to compete with that. Uh, cause essentially that's what we're in is the trades. Um, but going back to the culture, um, Honestly, what we're trying to create is a team atmosphere. Um, like that's at the end of the day, we just, we're a team. We're here for each other. Um, if you need something, I'm there for you. If I need something from you, you're there for me. Um, it's a give take relationship. Uh, and that ultimately like it's a friendly, happy go lucky, fun environment that we're trying to create. Um, I'm not saying that we've achieved that, um, at times I can see that, you know, really coming to fruition, um, and people really, you know, having fun on the job and at the same time being productive because at the end of the day, like there, there are stats out there for this, but people go to work because they enjoy the people that they work with and they enjoy going to their job. It, it, it really isn't money driven, but at the same time, I think you need to show people and give people and show them that you can create a career for them. Uh, you can offer them if they put in the work, put in the time, show the responsibility, show the skills, um, and are the right person, they can make $40 an hour. Uh, they can make eighty dollars to $90,000 a year with benefits and RSV plans. Um, there, there's possibilities out there. Um, you just got to find that right person that you're willing to do that for. Um, and you have to be the right business. You have to, you know, have the sales and the money and the profits to back that up, of course. But um, that's our goal is, and then I think that's the only way you're really going to retain people unless you want to hire people every, you know, one to five years, you want to hire new people over and over and over and over again. Um, obviously labor roles, you're going to continuously do that. But um, at the end of the day, like just to sum up my answer on, you know, our culture, I want it to be a team atmosphere. Um, there's no, like, you know, my, I have a partner on site. He's no better than the guy that's running wheelbarrows. Um, if Derek needs to run wheelbarrows, he'll run wheelbarrows. If I need to come there and run wheelbarrows, I'll run wheelbarrows. We're a team. We're looking to achieve a common goal. Um, at the end of the day, uh, th that's what it comes down to. Mike, what is Paver King's company culture? Is this something you put a lot of time in thinking about and implementing? Uh, I, I think maybe subconsciously I spend a lot of time on, co on company culture. Um, I think like even if you look at, um, you know, my mild obsession with Cobra Kai, uh, you know, the strike first, strike hard, no mercy. I, I think that, you know, stuff like that becomes your culture. It, it, you know, when you say it enough times, um, and people are like, well, how did you how did you become the paver king? And I'm like, I just called myself paver king enough times that everyone believed it. There's nothing saying that I'm the king of favors. I just said it so much that people are like, that guy's the paver king. Right? I, I think that when you trying to if we're trying to create a culture, um, you know, I feel like we have a good company culture. I think that it needs some work here and there. Um, well, lots of days I think it needs some work. But you guys haven't spent a lot of Jordan spent time with Kaz, so you would know. Uh, but I just think that, you know, for us, even, you know what, like the whole uh, fuck decks, build patios thing, like our guys really like that, our, our, our whole team. They all think it's awesome that we're, you know, I'm willing to put myself out there and, and make that statement and take whatever heat shall fall my way. Uh, you know, like it just, uh, I think that that's sort of our culture is that we're, we, we work hard, we play hard. Um, we get a lot of work done. I think that, you know, I, through our team and through the teams I've worked with, I carry a reputation of um, a very, very high quality of work. Uh, you know, we've been featured in lots of catalogs and stuff, and our, our, our team takes a lot of pride in that. That, you know, even last year, our fireplace was still in the Kettle Block catalog. You know, it was the, it's an older picture, but it's still there every year. Um, you know, so... It, uh, I think that that's, you know, high quality of work. We, I, I believe in doing things the right way, even if we lose money and that, that our team reflects that. Like I screwed up this year and a client asked to take a patio out and I took the whole item out, forgetting that I still needed the, you know, the $5,000 retaining wall to support the backyard, even though I didn't need the patio anymore there. 
Um, and when we realized it and we're on site, we put the wall in. I didn't charge them anything. I didn't go back at them. That was my mistake. They hired me because I'm a professional. And when I screw up, I got to pay. But I'll just keep screwing up. And that's not what professional people do. But I think when our team sees, you know, me say, okay, I, I fucked that up. And we're going to do right by these people because they hired us. Um, I think that that spreads through the team, knowing that I'll, I'll, I'll admit when I made a mistake and I'll pay for my own mistakes and I don't make anyone else pay for them. Um, I think that goes a long way. Uh-huh. With, and that's, I think that's sort of our company culture. No, I think we need to work on it too, like everyone. There's some things that I would um, prefer, but we also have a culture of showing up. I, I'm, I'm on time every day. It'd be hard pressed to find someone that knew I was late because I think that if I'm late, that just establishes that anyone can be late. I mean, any time. So um, I think a lot of the culture derives from um, the ownership group and they lead the team. So Definitely. Tony, same question to yourself. Uh, Company culture, do you spend time thinking about it? Do you spend time putting it into like implementing it? Uh, Nothing that I specifically think about. Um, Like, I mean, I keep saying it's when it comes to our team, it's very go with the flow. It's it's funny. The team has created their own culture, right? Um, We have music on the job. We obviously have our inside jokes. I find that's very important. They just happen by accident. It's like, you you know, when you have those inside jokes or those stupid little sayings, um, stupid names for certain tools, like things like that, that it just kind of creates that they know, you know, they'll go somewhere else just to give an example. They'll go work somewhere else and they'll say it and they know that the person's like, what are you talking about? You know, it, it's just a bond. It, very minimal things like that create a bond. And my, you know, obviously we have our, uh, uh, our team like group chat, which is, you know, it is for work, you know, Hey, tomorrow it's raining, uh, everybody on standby, like usual, but it like, it's winter. We're in the off season, but we're still using it, you know, Christmas, Merry Christmas or happy new year or, or whatever, or just, Hey, check out this meme, you know, like just kind of keep that, that family culture going, uh, just like the way I have a family group chat, right. With my brothers and my, you know, my siblings and my um the, the boyfriends the girlfriends of them and all that um i try to keep the same thing with the way i would treat my family is the way i treat my team and uh, they treat each other like family which is very important but like i said i don't think that if i wanted to implement that that i could that's something that just has to grow on its own and uh spending more time together than we do with our own families i think that naturally happens um but I've been lucky enough that I've never had uh, turmoil either, which is a big thing. And I, I've seen it uh, through other companies, just yeah, team members uh, that just don't like each other or, or get into a fight, not physically. I mean, that, that has happened too. Not for me, but I know it is a thing. Um, but, you know, they, they just disagree on something. Like as a, a business owner, um, I've had disagreements, like I've, I, two employees disagree, I just get on it right away, you know? And I have to say in, in 10 years, I might've had to do it once, twice, not more than that, but I, I, I would hate to see what happened if I didn't, you know? Cause once you get that, once that, that insect gets into the, the team, you know, and it's like an insect that gets into a parasite that gets into a plant, it's just gonna poison it from the inside out. So it's the same thing. I find if you have a problem in your team, you have to solve it. And if that means somebody that's not a good fit for your team has to go, they have to go. But luckily, I've never had to deal with that. But uh, that's how I would deal with it if it were the case. So your employees need to know you have their back um, and they're going to have yours. And I think that's in essence of what our company culture is. Mm -hmm. If a customer is thinking about going with one of your guys' companies, what sets your business apart from uh, others that might be going up against you? Uh, what what are those value adds that a customer has to go with DPR, to go with pa- uh, Pavercane, to go with Group Zamco? Are these things that you really work on to set yourself apart, to, you know, uh, just drawing on examples, I, I know Pride Hardscape, he mentions that he adds lighting to all the jobs that he can, and he only charges materials for it because it just sets that so much apart. Things like this, not necessarily, you know, that specific or, or that, you know, money oriented. It could be anything. But what's that value add that your business has 
for that customer. Tony, do you want to kick this one off? Um, well, it, in my industry, like in my market, um, I'm very lucky to be, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm alone. There are some amazing contractors uh, here in Montreal, um, but I have kind of created, um, well, I've entered a niche market. Uh, when people contact us, they know that obviously they're not going to pay the cheapest. Uh, my goal is not to be the cheapest and not to gain more money, but to be able to do the job properly. And the clients could see that um, social media comes back into this, right? Uh, through social media, we're able to distinguish why we're different from our competitors. I look at my competitors and, you know, they, they post some pictures of their jobs and all that, but uh, they won't, they don't really show um, the building process or they're not at, very active. It's easy to, to post a picture of a job once it's all done up and touched up and all that stuff, but show it while it's being built and all that. Uh, not to say that that's the, the key to anything, but um, I think it plays a part. Social media really opens us up to uh, our potential clients and our existing clients and all that. Uh, so I, I would feel, I think that what sets us apart is one, obviously our designs. We're not afraid to, to really go that extra mile. And all I care about right now, to give an example is every winter, it's the same thing. Okay. What we did last year was awesome. Uh, these are the products coming out. This is what other people did. I don't want to do any of that. What do I want my thing to be this year without it being the only theme of the year? So I'm always trying to be one step ahead, not to say we always are, but that's our goal is to be one step ahead of our competitors. I think that's what sets us apart and that's what the clients are paying for. They know they're getting a personalized service. They know they're getting um, something that most contractors will be, I, I, I mean, for lack of a better word, too lazy to do, you know, it's just, oh, uh, it's easy to lay pavers, but to do two thicknesses of pavers and all that, it's a bit more complicated. Not much. I'm too lazy for that one. <laughs> too lazy for that one. Yeah. Josh, just never mind. To uh, blue 80 with some Victorian 80. <laughs> they still have it. <laughs> <I'm too lazy. laughs> yeah. Or just cut down. I cut agree. down I, those I, I, I just from an outside looking in. The value out of your company is design. Sorry, yeah. bro. Like from the outside looking in, the value add from your company is the For design. Sure. It sets you apart from the rest of it sets you apart from the rest of Instagram. That's Thank crazy, you. man. You think about that. Sets you apart rest of like a user-based thing that has 105 billion users or whatever, and you stand alone. So I mean, I think that your value add is definitely your design. Thank you. you I appreciate that. I'm definitely, I'm definitely too lazy to do it, bro. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm still. We're not. We're not. Yeah, I mean, all of us. All of us on this this podcast, we understand the time and effort it takes to do that stuff that you're doing. Man. 100 mil to 80 mil to 60 mil. Like, I see you do it all the time. I understand it. I watch it. I'm like, man, that is. I wouldn't even start to go down that road, man. I have a big list of shit that's all the same thickness. <laughs> so, you know, that's where my list goes. Like, I just, Categories. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, like, bro, like your design sets you apart from the rest of the world, man. Not yeah. just your know, market. That's my opinion. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Very nice of you to say. Uh, but that, I mean, that's, that's what we try though. That's, that's the, the kind of impression we're trying to make is, um, and I always say it like everything's possible, right? So it's really just a matter of doing it. And that's what we try to do. Uh, so I think, I don't know, I, I find like I have clients that literally call me up. And I think that when we did our how, to, uh, I'm a hardscaper uh, podcast, um, I actually, we went through this and I, I told you that about that client that was searching and searching and searching and had a terrible experience with one contractor. Um, and he was searching for a long time at like one or two in the morning. He just starts like hitting his wife. He's like, Hey, yeah, I found the guy. I found the guy. And then she's like, well, what are you trying to tell me? And then he's like, no, I found the hearts. I found the, the landscaper is going to do our, our pavers. And uh, he found us on Instagram and he said, wow, you know, you guys stand out so much. And uh, I mean, that's when that happened. I was like, damn, that, that's what we're doing this for, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, uh, and that's it. And people tell us, you know, like, Oh, you know, your, your work is very different. So I, but it, it's become almost like uh, an addiction. Uh, and again, Mike, I know you said addiction is the wrong word to use, um, but it is, it's an addiction to try to like put new stuff out there. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, when people like Mike, especially Mike's been in the game for so long and uh, uh, probably more knowledgeable than, than all of us here, <laughs> um, you know, appreciates and sees that what we're doing is, is hard and it's, it's not as simple as just laying it out. And, uh, but it pays out when, when 
people understand what we're doing, right? So I, I think that my clients have a good basis of what we're doing and that it's different. Um, and we, we kind of ride that horse, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you've built that brand of those designs. And I, and I do remember that story you brought up on that I am a hardscaper. And I did mention that, you know, your designs, you, you kind of know when you come across somebody's design on Instagram, when you're scrolling through, before you even look at the the name of it, you say, well, that looks like a group Zamco design. And you've you kind of built that image for your, your business, definitely. Uh, going over to Mike now, Mike, what's your value add at Paver King in terms of what, what, why go with somebody with yourself if, if you're a customer? Uh, I honestly think a big value add for us is that our, our company is very woman driven. Um, you know, we have Nancy uh, designing. Um, we have Kelly uh, running the office and work and being on site. Um, and we have Christy driving. And I think that um, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I spend a, a vast amount of time at a sales call discussing our team because I think that, um, we're going to invade these people's lives. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, attack their yard, and we're going to be around for a while. And we're old and slow, so it's going to be longer than if Jordan and Derek were doing it. So, you know, we're in the same market, so I have to separate myself. Uh, I'm just joking. I don't think I've ever placed a job against Jordan, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely um, the fact that we are a female-driven. I mean, literally driven, like quite literally driving a truck. Um, a female driven company, it means it makes a big difference. Um, and it makes a big difference to our whole sort of being when we're on site and how things are handled. And I just I think that you know having three women play incredibly prominent roles in our business um, definitely is a value add and sets us apart from um, you know if Jordan works in our market. I don't know anyone that has a more um, woman driven business than ours. You know, even jo- like Christy was driving for Jordan and he told me a story that I, you know, about how she altered their job site just being there for a brief period of time getting a truck loaded. So, uh, you know, like I just, I think that that's a huge value add for us and it's really important to um, the homeowners that we're, um, we have a diverse um, company with a lot of different people. And that's, you know, that's also, also I mean, I, I'll be honest, like I lean on, I do lean hard on the fact that I've been doing this for a really long time and I have no other way to make a living. And so I will be around next year. So I do, I do lean on that too as a value add. That just I've been around for a long time in Durham, and I tell people, you want to look me up, you want to Google me. Um, you know, I sat on the Landscape Ontario board. I've, you know, been to, I've done, I, I've done speaking. I've been all over the like I, you know, flown to Alberta to do speaking engagements about landscaping. So, um, you know, it just it's. I think that that's where I lie. You know, where our women. Um, are definitely our, our biggest asset at our company, and, and I definitely promote that. And then just lean back on my experience and my, you know, sales. I spent a lot of time learning how to sell because Jordan will know this. I say it all the time. You make a lot more money with a pen than you do with a shovel, or you can't shovel. You can't, shovel your, you can't shovel your way to a good price. If your price is crap from the beginning, you can't get there and work harder to make it better. So. No, those are hard lessons that I learned. And so I spend a lot more time on sales and that definitely has a um, effect on a value to people. Definitely. And over to you, Jordan. Uh, what's the value add with DPR Landscapes? Yeah, um, I think we have a value add for sure. Um, I just want to first say like Tony, um, unreal like work on driving, you know, the way your business is and finding that niche market. Um Personally, that's that's my goal is to find that niche market as well and find that market where, you know, I'm people are more or less hiring me because they're on me and not because I'm competing. I'm, you know, I'm going into quotes and competing with other people, um, but contacting you because they're hiring you because of the work you do. So in saying that, I mean, everything that we do um, is trying to set ourselves up to be that company, uh, to be that company to say, you know what, you need your friend says, um, you know, I need a hardscape job done. And the friend that has contacted us says, you know, you need to contact EPR because my project's been in the ground for 10 years and it hasn't moved an inch. Um, so our, our, our call to and our go to, you know, why we are who we are is quality matters. Um, it's nothing to do with being ultra creative. It's nothing to do with being um, the fanciest or anything like that, but making sure our projects last. So 
I can tell you, bear none, we have never caught a corner. Um, we don't cut corners. We do things the right way and we do it once. Um, that's what I try to, you know, portray to my clients. Um, I'm very open with my clients and saying, you know, obviously I'm very young. Um, so I say to my clients, if you want to talk to my past clients, feel free. I know, you know, I could name 10 of them right now that would be happy to take a call from you in the next 24 hours. Um, because our clients realize the amount of work and effort that we put into their projects. Uh, so that's really how we try to separate ourselves from competition is going that extra mile and the structural integrity of our projects and making sure that they last. Because if your project's going to last, eventually someone's going to refer you. Eventually someone's going to go to that person and say, I need a project done exactly like yours. And they're going to refer you to the person that did it right the first time. Um, instead of if you did the project wrong um, and, you know, you have a pool patio and you've had hundreds of friends over um, and your project starts to fall apart, your name's going to fall apart. And so, you know, you're going to be competing with the people on, you know, home stars or whatever that may be, or these low quality lead generation um, software programs, right? Like that, that's not the way we're looking to take our business. So at the end of the day, it's, it's quality, but then we also call it and, you know, it's in our little package and so on and so forth is the DPR experience. Um, and that's what we call it. And it's basically from myself being completely transparent with you. Um, every single aspect of your job will be included in your contract so that if there's ever a discrepancy or you ask for an addition, it's clear. I've never had to make a change order form with my clients because I tell them the price and they can see in their contract that that was not included in it. It's it's just that transparency with your clients and communication with your clients and taking that time on the initial consultation to also explain these things. Why are you different than your competitors? Explaining your base preparation, explaining why you're doing things on their yard. Like why are you putting a retaining wall here? And what is the need to having a retaining wall here? Why do you feel like a garden bed is going to work better in this situation instead of doing a full you know, front entrance, that's entire pavers, right? It's being transparent with your client and looking out for them at the end of the day. Um, at the end of the day, I'm looking to create relationships so that those relationships bring me more jobs. It's not gouging every single client for every single dollar that they have. And, you know, maybe their project will look good for two years. Um, every project looks great when it's done. To me, it's how does your project look 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Um, so th that's our value add is quality, quality construction. Um, it's not, I mean, I, I, you know, submit these really cool designs all the time, but I just don't have that market for them. Um, but at the end of the day, it's finish the job, like, you know, within the budget that the client asked for, uh, do it right and do them right. And at the end of the day, you're going to get more jobs. Mm -hmm. What about when a customer comes to you guys, <laughs> what are some red flags that you see with customers that make you think, you know what, this is not the right customer for my, me, for myself, for my business. What, what is something that they say? What is something that they do? Maybe speak on experience in that. Mike, do you want to kick this off? Uh, sure. Absolutely. So, you know, the biggest residential job I ever looked at is, you know, probably in the upwards of $3 million residential job in Toronto. And they just, the, the, it was a husband and a wife, and the wife was mean to Nancy, so we nailed their drawings back and told them they could screw up. <laughs> and I was just like, if you're not going to be nice to Nancy, then I don't really care. I care how much money you have. Um, I think that I've fired lots of clients. I've gotten to the end of lots of meetings and been like, yeah, no, I'm just not the right person for you. Like, I just um, sometimes, you know, if people are, I can, if I can go to someone's property and walk around with them and know right away. You know what their expectation is um, red flags for me is if someone's endlessly discussing um, price you know it just for us and where we are in our business i don't i will never be the least expensive price um you know it's just not who we are i don't think you can do the job right and be the, i mean i guess you can do the job right and be the least expensive but you just don't have any money to survive and then you won't be there it's just problem um you know i just I can get a feeling for people right away. I also know, you know, after years, I spent, I've spent a lot of time tracking who I'm successful with. So if I show up at a house and there's a single woman living in the house, I know I close like 95% of those 
those points. That's just a market that I play well to for some reason. A um, face like that, that, of course. Well, maybe not without the beard. I don't <laughs> know. Like it's a new thing. For me. So, um, but you know, I know I play well to that market. Um, so, but then I also know I don't play well to um, the market where the husband is ultra aggressive. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't, I just don't, I, you, you make the most money you'll make all year is on the job you don't do where you have a bad feeling. If I have any kind of irk or feeling at all, I just walk away. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, there's so many leads and I'll tell people like, listen, like I've, I've been doing this 30 years. I've worked every day. I've never woken up and had nowhere to go. So I'm not scared about not getting a job. It's cool. Like, you know, if you don't, I just, you know, if someone says to me, oh, I've, you know, the, the other, we actually did a job this year, which I didn't think we were going to get because the lady said to me, oh, the other guy said, I don't need this. And I'm like, well, that's fine. Call him. I don't care. I've worked every day for 30 years. I'm not doing, doing your job. Ain't going gonna, ain't gonna to break me. I'm good. See you later. And I left. But it was a client of Nancy's. And Nancy called me like two weeks later and said, hey, this lady wants to do a job. And I'm like, why? She said, she only really was honest. Yeah, like, okay. Well, I think that, you know, if someone gives you one red flag, walk. There's so many leads. You don't need to put it. It's just your business will make more money finding people that you click with. You don't need to work for people that you don't like. Or like, I don't, if I honestly, if I don't like someone, then I don't, because it also affects the relationship going down the road. Like it, if I don't like someone, I'm less likely to do like, to, to, if they come out and make a change, I'm probably going to be a little bit more st- like, you know, um, standoffish about it just because I don't particularly like them as a person. I, you know, I, don't, I just found that, you know, it. I also don't have a big machine to feed. You know, I can say these things saying that I'm not feeding a big machine. Like if you're feeding five crews or four crews and you're feeding a big machine, inevitably, and I've, I have in my life fed a big machine like that. And like, you know, you, you're taking leads that you, people you don't like, people you have a bad feeling about. You know, I, I honestly, man, like I can look now and be like, I've never closed a job in this neighborhood. It's not worth my time. And I'll just email them and be like, listen, I've never closed a job in your neighborhood. I'm really, I don't know why I don't get along with this down my house, but <laughs> here's five other people I know call them. Um, you know, sometimes jobs just don't suit your business too. Like if it's something that doesn't suit our business, then I tell people, I'm really sorry. This just isn't, you know, my overhead of, you know, doesn't, I can't come do this. I don't have a 1500 pickup truck and a broken wheelbarrow I bought off the Gigi. I can't do this. It's not in my overhead. So I, I'm just honest with people. But you know, red flags definitely are, if I just literally don't like, if I walk on, I literally don't like someone, or I don't like the way, because I do almost every consultation with um, Nancy or Kelly does consultations too. And if they're not nice to Nancy or Kelly, I got no time for that. Mm-hmm. And over to you, Jordan, red flags that uh, you've experienced or just red flags in general that uh, you look out for when meeting with a customer. Yeah, so this is something I've uh, learned over time. I uh, can't say I'm the master of this because obviously I'm a lot longer, younger than the two people that I'm here with. Um, so I'm learning as I go. Uh, so I have made those mistakes and worked for really bad clients before. Um, not to say a lot of my clients are like that because my price usually drives people away. Um, however, I have, you know, maybe tried to push a job a little harder than I should have just because I was worried about where my, where my guys were going to be that day or where they're going to be the day after or so on and so forth. Uh Oh yeah. I feel like Jordan was Jordan. You've been voted off the Island, bro. <laughs> Oh, oh, he did. He did. Oh, <laughs> I was just joking. I didn't really want to come off the island. Wow. Mike, you're harsh, man. It's Jordan, you're, you're the Wi Fi fuzz. Ouch. Sorry, Jordan. Oh, man. That's vicious stuff, bro. Oh, man. I didn't even do anything. Oh uh, yeah, I guess I guess he got booted off the island, as you said, but uh, we'll see if he kind of tries to join in back in here. <laughs> just unplug this router yeah well uh we'll go to tony here tony uh can you pick up where jordan left off there <laughs> wait <laughs> yeah and anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean red flags that you you've experienced in the past with clients things to look for when you're meeting with clients 
Uh, you know what? I've, I've grown a judge of character. I, I've uh, acquired a, a judge of character that I did not have before. I thought I did. And I, I still think that I don't have the perfect judge of character. Um, but I, I have to say, once we got... A, how can I put it? Once we stopped trying to compete for price, we gained better clients. Right when we were competing for price, I would say at, at the beginnings, uh, the early stages of the uh, the business, um, that's when I was getting. I mean, I had I have to say for the majority of my clients were great clients, and I would gladly do. And I not only would gladly do business with them now, I I still do business with some of them because uh, they bought other houses over the last ten years or whatever the case is. But um, definitely now, once like Mike said, once they start fixating on price then I, I kind of, I wouldn't say that I purposely uh, brush them off, but I, I discourage them by saying, you know, like, okay, well, I, I'm never going to flat out tell somebody, you know, like, oh, well, you know, but this is expensive, you know, but once they say like, well, what would this cost? I, I just give them the range. Look, I've done projects of this size worth 60000 and I've done the exact same project square footage wise for 200000 so it's in that range. I can't give you a, a, an approximate. And usually you could tell right from there, uh, their answer is going to give you a very good indicator of um, how they're going to be going forward. Because it's normal. Everyone asks, like, you know, I don't, I've never done this before. What does this cost? Um, and that's fine. That's cool to ask. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you say that and they're like, oh, okay. Um, you're like, that's when, if I see them reacting, you know, very negatively, I'll be like, well, what, what's your budget? Like, what were you... What did you foresee? Don't let, let, let you answer the question. Now, what would you, what did you foresee? Oh, well, I mean, I thought I could get something done. Or my, my buddy did his uh, uh, for 40,000. Uh, you know, it's about the same size. Like, okay, well, when did he do it? Oh, it was uh, about five years ago. Well, five years is a long time in this industry. And I think there's been more movement in the last five years than, than I've ever seen. Uh, Price-wise too, they've gone up a lot. But regardless, I filter out at that point where it's like, um, I figure that once they call us now, uh, nowadays I say once they call us, they know that they're, uh, they're going to pay more than they'll pay. I wouldn't say anybody else because I can't speak for other people's prices, but the majority of other contractors, but I will deliver for every penny over my competitor's price. And that's a big thing. And I've always said this, there's nothing wrong with charging more if you're delivering more. If you're charging more to deliver the same thing as your competitor, then you're just gouging the client. At that point, you don't deserve that, that extra uh, markup uh, because it should never be a markup. It should be value for dollar. You know what I mean? And as long as you're delivering value for dollar, that's great. But um, I, I started to kind of pre-qualify on the phone because uh, the difference this year is uh, I actually have my brother selling for me too now. Um, I brought him on on the sales because I was just, I mean, this season, I think it was one of the craziest seasons in, in hardscape. Hey, what's up, Jordan? <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Guys, I just want to point out one thing. Because, um, you know, in Quebec, we're, we have this, like, curfew, this lockdown. Oh, yeah. So, like, we're, we're basically in the purge right now. There is yeah. nothing going on out there. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Thing. I have not been out of the house during, like, since Saturday during the 8 to 5. And wow. uh, it is creepy. It is, like, it's really dark out there. Do you need yeah. to be getting home, Tony, or? No, no. Oh, it, no? At this point, like, if they pull me over, it's very simple. I'm leaving work. Like, you're allowed to leave uh, okay. work. Or, and technically, I don't uh. know. I own my own business, so who's to say what my work hours are? I could be on the road whenever I want. Right, right. Fair enough. So yeah, yeah but they just wanted to point That's that out. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's really weird. And and people keep having fun with the purge signals, the sirens. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny the first night, but it's getting old now. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry to get back to it. It's really uh, I because my brother's dealing with sales. I don't want him wasting his time. It's funny. You don't value your own time as much as you value someone else's when you're asking them to do something. So because I don't want him wasting his time, I, I've been uh, pre-qualifying a lot on the phone where I will tell people, like, um, just to let you know, uh, we are booked until this time. If they're in a rush, 
it depends how they answer you. You know what I mean? If you tell them, like, if you're looking for the job, you know, soon, unfortunately, we can't help you. If they're like, well, you know, I would like it, but it's it's cool. Then you know right off the bat that this client knows who you are, knows what you bring to the table, and is willing to wait. So that, that I think, plays a big part. I could tell right away if it's my type of client or not. But like Mike said, it really comes down to the feeling. You could tell if you click with someone on a personal level or not, regardless of sales, regardless of the industry, regardless of anything, you could tell if you like someone or you don't like someone. And if you don't like someone, every day on that project is a day you don't want to be there. So I, I think that that's a big part. We have, there's, the sun comes up for everybody. There's more than enough work for every single contractor out there. We can't possibly do it all. We can't possibly build every hardscape project. Uh, so I will gladly walk away from a project that I won't have fun building. So I think that's a big part of it. And I'll let Jordan pick up. Jordan, I think your head was tilted a bit like this. There we go. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jordan, pick up where you left off, man. Yeah. So sorry about that, but no um, won't won't go into it. Um, not at my desk, but anyways. Um, yeah. So I mean, I've learned a lot over the over the years that you know I've been doing this. Um, I have made the mistakes of pushing for clients, as I was trying to say there. Um, but, you know, just to keep the guys busy or so on and so forth. But, you know, I realized, you know, I, I push for that client and then I get a call the next day. That's a client that I do want to work for. Um, not that it's happened much to us because of, you know, the the price and the market that we're in where we don't we don't put ourselves in that situation where, I'm, I'm competing with multiple people. Um, but I would say red flags for me are, you know, they mentioned, Oh, this other contractor said this, this other contractor said that. And if I can't, you know, use my knowledge to make them realize what I can do is better. And they keep mentioning things like price, price, price. Um, you know, it's not the client for us. Uh, the first thing, if a client calls us and they ask, what do you charge per square foot? I know right off the bat that they're not the client for us. Um, it's similar to what Tony said. I mean, um, it, one of the things that I've really helped us start to pre-qualify clients is, you know, we're now booking in advance, right? I mean, I don't have the luxury that Tony has that he's booked the entire year, but, you know, we're booking into, you know, the middle of August. So if someone calls me and I tell them, you know, we're booking the middle of August and they're like, no, 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 I want my project in April. I know what kind of contractor they're going to hire. They're going to hire the guy that charged per square foot. They're going to hire the guy, like Mike said, that has a 1500. Um, you know, I've been that guy, don't get me wrong, but um, he's, those are the kind of people that they're going to hire and they're just not, it doesn't fit our overhead, doesn't fit our team. It doesn't fit our goals. Um, so yeah, it's little things like that. Um, one thing we have tried to put in place, and I mentioned this on the How to Hardscape, is putting a budget on our website. So even if I get a call over the phone and I get a good vibe, and even if it was a referral from another person, I ask them to go and submit their um, their form submission online um, and fill out their budget. Uh, because that's really important to us because we only take a certain dollar figure because we know that that's what works for us. Um, for me, I, I only want to do one job at a time. I don't want to have right now. I don't have the, you know, the tools, the equipment, the man power to do multiple jobs at a time. So if I'm going to do one job at a time, there's going to be four to five guys on that job. So if you're going to take a job that's 10 or $15,000, I mean, it's not a four to five guy job, right? Like it's, it's just not going to work. Um, you're not going to make any money. Uh, so even if I, like I said, get a call over the phone, I send them to our website, ask them to fill that out. Um, Cause that gives that client the time to sit down, be with their significant other, discuss these important decisions. Uh, not to say that that's set in stone, um, you know, the budget that they give me, but it's something to work off of. Um, so you yeah, have little things, you know, to summarize, just, you know, someone asking me about square footage pricing and then, you know, like Mike said, I mean, you know, when you start meeting someone, you know, um, you know, Mike deals well with uh, single women. Uh, for me, I deal well with the hard, hard male. 
So that's how I sell. So the hard mail that's drilling me on constructions, construction questions, I can bang off my answers um, to him and I win that client over um, because of those things. So everyone has their things and the, the stuff that they specialize in. But for me, you know, I, I, I strive on the people that are looking for excellence and that are very meticulous and ask me those very hard questions, but shouldn't be, or, you know, are a little bit more, um, anal, uh, some people may describe it as, um, those very specific questions, but I strive with those types of type of clients. Gotcha. Gotcha. Before we leave this, I have a good story from this year that Jordan's actually part of. So <laughs> I went to see this like crazy custom home. And when I got there, like everything in the house was half finished. The garage door it was only one garage door, not two. The trim wasn't finished. And I was like, I was already kind of creeped out by the whole thing. And then the guy has like, you know, outrageous plans and he wants to do this and he wants to do that. And, um, so what I did was we, I said, okay, well, you got to have a landscape design. I said, Nancy, go up there and take very limited measurements and then send this guy a bill for 350 bucks. And she did that. She produced like a subtle drawing, took her an hour sent the guy a bill for 250 bucks. He never paid it. So I was like, okay, well, we're not going to go work for this dude. Like now I know in advance that this is, you know, we just did like a test run. And then Jordan could have passed. I emailed every contractor I know in Durham and said, don't go to this freaking house. This guy's an ass. <laughs> yeah. You on that email, right? Yeah. Amazing. Oh, yeah. This <laughs> yeah, exactly. No mercy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, hey, this guy didn't pay Nance. I emailed everyone. This guy's an ass. Like, I don't know, like 30 yeah. guys. I emailed everyone. Like, I know. Yeah. I kind of know. And he hired the contractor that works for fifteen dollars an hour. Probably, yeah. I don't, I, <laughs> especially the thing, creepy thing was when I got up to the top of the house in this middle of these trees. The guy had all these hunting cameras set up and started calling me, going, "Hey, you're on my property." And he told me to be here, bro. Anyway, it was just a good way to figure out was someone was it someone we wanted to work for, like you know. And then I just, I think I reimbursed Nancy for her time because I was like, whatever, it was me that sent you there, so. Um, I don't know if the guy got that. Anyway, whatever. It was just a good way to figure out, you know, am I am I reading this wrong? Is this guy really a good guy? Or, you know, I, let's do a test run here for 300 bucks and see what happens. Right. And nothing good happens. So we're like, we're out. Yeah. It, and it's hard. You know, the thing is, sometimes it's hard. Like, you're looking at this plan and it's hard to walk away from a job that could be awesome. You know what yeah. I mean? You're just like, damn, if this was the same job with a client that wasn't this client it would be amazing and it sucked yeah. right and you and it's just to really put your foot down and what i love is like mike's mike's um angle is very uh human right it's literally just it's a personal connection it's it's experience uh based um mine i try to base it off experience but I, i've been burned and it's it's something that i'm growing but like jordan probably has like the most structured um way of of pre-qualifying and i've i've tried putting together one of those lists i've had i had my wife work i have my wife work on a lot of things i never guess the fruition which that's really bad for oh, i've been there i've been there <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> with like this whole like three four page list together and i'm like yeah okay and it never got implemented but um i wanted to do exactly that like i want to know right off the bat uh what is what are you looking to put in and and budgets because budgets everything i was i was giving a, not giving away my designs but i was designing uh for free i just wasn't sending them to the client but regardless if i'm sending it to the client or not i'm still showing them you know what their house could look like i'm giving them my ideas and they're going to the cheaper guy and, and i got so fed up and that's why i wanted to implement something like that uh whereas n now i charge for my designs 100 percent. it's that if you're not going to pay for the design, um, then you're, you're definitely not going to pay my price, right? Because especially that I, I'm charging the design, but then I take it as a, as a, uh, as part of the deposit once the contract signed. So if the client's serious, they know they have nothing to lose. And the ones that are serious are like, yeah, no problem. Like right away, they, they know that they're not going to lose out because they know that they're not just giving me money and I'm going to put together, oh, this is a square patio. It's like, I'll put something together for you. But even at that, I still will not go to the extent of putting the inserts and all that because that's still not – there's not an amount of money you could pay me to give away what the essence of our company is. Mm -hmm. I'll create so, the design. Yeah. 
So it's it's really tricky. I think pre qualifying is is a major major obstacle for a lot of contractors, um, and. I think when you have the leisure to walk away from a client, or I would say, lack of a better word, when you have the balls to walk away from a client, uh, it really puts you in an advantageous position. And there's some humility in that as well. Like, um, you're not afraid to to turn it down. You're not. It it kind of brings you down to ground level too with that client, uh, and brings the client down to ground level too. So it's kind of like it works out for everybody. If 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 you do your due diligence, like especially like Jordan does, because he definitely goes above and beyond uh, what I do to pre-qualify, but I would definitely take, I'm definitely going on his website after this. <laughs> and check yeah, it out. check it out. <laughs> the, the pages are still being built. So it's uh, pre-built. We're in uh, stage three. Uh, it's been a long process just because, you know, I get busy with stuff, but yeah, stage three, go to form submission, you know, you get to ask what you want to put in. Yeah. And then I'm, uh, I'm even editing our budget this year anyways, like I'm, I'm upping our minimum job. Um, but one thing, Tony, I wanted to ask you, uh, have you ever had an experience charging a client for a design, but then the client feels like they own your design now and they go and take it to another contractor and decide to use your design, but they, they paid for it. So technically they own it. Um, and I've done that to you because I've had it done two different ways to me. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. I've had it done when I wasn't paid for it. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, for sure. You know? um, and I think that I, I, I've actually only had it done when I, when um, it wasn't paid. Um, and okay. not that I sent it to them, but uh, actually it happened no twice. Once um, they just ran with the ideas that I gave, but mm. they hired worse than hiring a company that works at like 15 bucks a square foot, just to say they hired two employees from a company working down the street at $15 a square foot, like the worst of the worst. They didn't even go to the owner of the company. They went to his employees. Oh, no. And as you could imagine, they did not own any equipment. So yeah. it took forever. They got kicked oh, yeah. the job. The client took it upon himself to finish it. Uh, and we worked two houses over. It was the best, like, it was the best feeling in the world. Two show. houses over, we came in and just killed it in like two weeks, the whole project. Um, and, and it just goes to show. But that client tried to copy our design. Uh, and I always had this saying, and it's like, Bruce Lee could teach me how to do karate, but I can't kick his ass. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, That's good. Okay. So I always say that it, it's really, uh, and then once it was <clears> bad <throat> judgment where I designed something and I presented it to the client, I did not send it to him, but he did not pay for it. But it was uh, a project of about 165000 So I bit the bullet and I did put the time into designing it and presenting it to him. Now I understand that uh, if the project's a project that big, that guy should have no problem paying uh, two grand for a design that actually does not come out of his pocket if, if you know, if you're, you're yeah. doing his project, if he's serious about you doing his project. <clears throat> so what he pulled was, it was later, it was about 9, 9.30 at night. And he's like, hey, do you mind if I, uh, can you send me these just so I can show my wife? I'm like, sorry, I do not send any uh, pictures unless you pay for the plan, you know? And he's like, oh, um, can I just take like a quick picture of your screen? Like my wife's in bed, you know, I, I, I want to show her. It was my lapse of judgment where I said, uh, yeah, you know what? Sure. Turns out the con the other contractor he was dealing with is a friend of mine. So he's like, hey, you know, we're bidding on the same project. And I'm like, did he show you? I'm like, I don't care that we're bidding on the same project. Dude, sun comes up for everyone. Whoever gets it, gets it. Um, it was way out of his league, but <laughs> whatever gets it, gets it. And yeah, so I'm like, I just want to know, did he show you the picture of my 3D? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. So because we're friends, I'll say this. If you try copying my design, I will destroy that project. <laughs> I go, just understand that. I have no shame. I have, I, I will become the worst version of myself if you copy my design. And I'm hoping that as a friend, you can protect it. And he, he, he didn't. He did not copy my design, but the client wanted him to. So after that, I said, you know what? Not even a picture of the screen, nothing. I, I, I learned that even the relationship, that's where I said sometimes I thought I had a better judge of character. Um, I, the way I see it, Jordan, is 
if the client's paying for it, charge enough for it uh, to make it worth um, their while to not hire someone else, not bring it somewhere yeah. else. But I also scare the client off in a sense of saying, look, um, you know, I design all that, but without telling them, like, don't bring it somewhere else. I tell them my projects are designed for me to build. Mm -hmm. You know, like I build my projects knowing my crew could pull it off. Mm -hmm. Maybe another team can. I, I can't say they won't, but I know that I can. So mm -hmm. now it's up to you to take the risk. If I design it, I'm going to build it. If someone, if someone else sees your design, they might give you, you know, the, the knockoff version of it and you will be able to tell that it's a knockoff. So I try to, I try to implant that seed. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I don't go all out either. I send that to them. This is your layout. But once I have a deposit and a contract, that's where I tell them, you know what? I want to talk about paver choices and the main, like, Right now we're talking about a general paver, but once I have a deposit, that's when I go all out. Yeah, I had an idea and I kill it on the, the layout and all that. But initially they're just getting, here's your pergola, here's your pool. It, it's still more impressive because it's in 3D than they're getting anywhere else. Fair enough. Yeah. So I try to keep, I try to protect myself that way. Okay. Yeah. Hope that yeah. answered the question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I just, I've experienced it two ways and both with uh, Nancy, um, who Mike works with as well. I mean, um, there's been a project where, you know, Nancy and I designed, Nancy got a fee up front and they hired some other guy just because the guy was cheaper on the contractor rate. Nancy got her rate. Nancy was taken care of. So that's great. Um, and then there's been another job we designed um, that was extremely, extremely similar to another design that they got. However, the client had paid for that design and they said, hey, like, I just want to make these little changes. So, you know, um, it, it was honestly like I, an identical design to the like very close. They just had a small little thing like a seat wall and a pillar here. And they had a, you know, they said the client wanted to walk in a wide driveway. I put it all on one side and the other person separated on two sides of the asphalt driveway. Um, so essentially they said, I paid for this. I feel like I can share this with you. Can you do this? And I said, sure. Right. You know, they, they pay for it. It's almost identical to the design that we provided them. Uh, but we closed that job because of the meeting that I had with the client. Um, so I've been on both sides of the coin. So it's just interesting to, you know, get, get your feedback on, you know, how you do things. Well, before I was charging, I used to actually have every client sign a uh, like an NDA. And still now, even when they pay for the design, I still have them sign that NDA. And I, I make it very clear. It's not about being a prick or anything like that. I go, I go, look, people call us because we have a certain reputation. We're known for our designs. Mm -hmm. um, and we take a lot of pride in our designs. So just out of respect, I, I appreciate if you sign this NDA. That's, that's the only requirement that I need. For, to, for me to present this to you um and i had a client straight up tell me and remember when we said like when do you know when to walk away she's like well is it actually enforceable I told her well how about forget the nda don't sign it it's cool i won't show you your design she's like, no 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 but i'm like no i mean if you're asking me if it's enforceable it means you already plan to break the rules of this nda yeah. so it's cool uh, i don't think that we're a good fit and the client was like shocked I look, I lost, you know, the two, three hours I put into that design, but at least I didn't show them like, and this was a very signature Zamco design. Like this would have been something it was, it's pretty much what I did across the street, like two months later. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, um, cause it was very, it was like the same house. So, uh, it was literally that, um, I I've been burned. I've been burned and it's taught me to be careful. But even at that, I don't think I'm done being burned yet. Like the people are sneaky and manipulative. Uh, not to say all of them, but there are, there are unfortunately some people that don't appreciate and don't respect the time and the effort that you put into, uh, you know, in, that we put into what we do. So sure. uh, yeah, that's it. Definitely. Uh, do you guys have like 15 more minutes to, to power through a couple important questions and then I got like a speed round for you? Yeah, I got, I got 9% battery, so I might have to relocate to a plug, but. All right. So uh, 
We that, should pay attention to that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I my computer before we started. So. Yeah. I, I, was, I was the most prepared person. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm not at my desk, man. <laughs> Trying to stay away from my crazy puppy. <laughs> Uh, the the conversation between debt or no debt in a business, how much is too much debt? Uh, debt versus no debt, where do you stand and why in terms of building your business with that? Mike, do you want to get us started, started with this? Uh, sure. I uh, We have debt. Um, I think that if you're not willing to, uh, I mean, and this is my opinion on it, I, if you don't want to be in debt and you want to uh, build your business without debt, then I have a lot of respect for that. And I think that's a really... Um, hard road to walk. Uh, so if you're walking that road, then, you know, I think that's amazing. But for us, I just, uh, too many times, you know, I'm not going to, if opportunity is knocking at the door, I'm not going to turn it down. Um, you know, so we've had, uh, you know, opportunities to do things in the last 18 months where I didn't have necessarily have the cash to ever buy, uh, say, RT 595. Um, you know, it's an $80,000. Uh, to be honest, you know a lot when you buy things and then you forget after like a month what you paid for it, right? So I think it was like 85 grand, but I honestly have no idea. Um, I, you know, so like, but that machine drove our business forward to a place that I wanted it to go in a commercial setting. And without that machine, our business wouldn't be where it is. But I didn't have $85,000 that I mean, that I wanted to spend on that machine at the time because I felt like it would take too much out of our cash flow. So you know, for me, I, we are a, a debt, in-debt business. We don't take on any debt that we don't have a plan. I don't buy anything that we don't have a specific plan on how it's going to pay for itself. Um, you know, like I, or how someone, not how it's going to pay for I make a plan on how other people are going to pay for our equipment. You know, that's how I plan things. So I look at our client base. I look at our, um, I look at our opportunities. Um, you know, our, our dump truck and people actually message me about it all the time. So for the whole hardscape community, it was, uh, it was $120,000. That's what we paid for it and the float. Um, but you know, our biggest client has uh, had a need and without taking on that $120,000, um, would we have, uh, we wouldn't be able to fulfill that need and he would have gone somewhere else and we wouldn't be able to grow our relationship with that client. So, I mean, for us, we take on practical debt, planned debt with plans to repay it. Um, we do not take, we do not, I don't take on small debt. Like if we need, um, you know, we're talking, we need to we're buying a couple of C cans and like, you know, we're going to pay cash for them. I'm not putting a $3,000 C can on a credit card, but when it comes to large, I mean, we have, when Christy loads up all our equipment on the float with the truck, we're rolling 400 grand down the road. Um, maybe not quite 300 grand down the road. You know, for us, I, you know, we needed to take on some debt for the ability to do that. But it, we also, you know, I have a lot of, we, I do a lot of planning for our business based around the age of our people. Mm. We're all old. I don't want to dig patios by hand. The first thing we bought was the $40,000 E20. Because I'm not digging patios. I'm 50 years old. I'm not digging patios by hand, period. It ain't happening anymore for me. If I go and look at something that's dig by hand, I'm going to call someone else some out later. You know, it just, it's not our, it's not for us. So um, you know, we take on debt, but we take on responsible debt. That's how our business works. Gotcha. Uh, Jordan, same question to yourself. Debt, no debt, where do you stand? What is too much debt for you? Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, you know, on the hard, How to Hardscape uh, episode that we spoke on. Um, so I started my business with no debt. Um, I solely could not get credit. Um, however, I felt it was a good direction to go well starting a business. Um, especially starting from scratch from, from where we were, we had no relationships, no nothing. Um, I mean, I was cleaning eaves troughs. Um, so I never knew when my next job was going to come from two weeks to the next or a month and a half to the next, depending on what month it was. Um, so I was doing a whole lot of everything. Uh, so I think, you know, getting started in business, um, I think it's smart to not take on debt, um, feel the waters out um, and then save yourself up. I mean, I've seen a lot of people say, but save yourselves up like, you know, three months worth of what, ever overhead you may be holding whether that be as simple as just a, a gas bill and 
you know, buying a couple more pieces of equipment that you need to while getting your business started. But if you're trying to grow your business into a custom design and build company that, you know, prides itself on quality, um, we have taken on debt in the sense of financing and leasing. Um, I do not have any bank loans. Um, I've never gone to the bank, you know, ask them for a hundred grand to keep as a floater, or we don't have a line of credit um, or an overdraft or anything like that. Um, so what's in our account is what's in our account per se, you know, other than having to pay our taxes from here to there. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, I think, it, I think it really depends on where you are in your business. Um, but for us, you know, we've, we've taken on more overhead. I mean, recently, you know, I've paid off a couple of machines and then I bought a couple of new things and I just calculated my budget for the new year. And I'm actually under my monthly overhead than I was last year, but I have more equipment than I've ever had. Um, but that's just cause I paid off some stuff that, you know, I was getting charged really high interest on in the past. Right. So, um, I mean, at the end of the day to, to run a business like this, I mean, who's got, depends on where you are, but one to $400,000 sitting around to just throw out equipment. No one does. Right. Um, so at the end of the day, I think you've really like, you have to know your numbers. I mean, you know, in the first three years of my business, um, me and my past business partner were operating blind, just completely blind. Um, we were just charging per square foot. We were, you know, doing what we had to do. We were just operating blind. Um, whereas in the last three years, really sat down and created processes and created, you know, looking at like how many billable hours are there in a year for how many employees do I have? How much do I need to charge for every single one of those employees to make the revenues that I need to, but more importantly, what's my overhead per year? And, you know, as a hardscape business, I think it's really important. If you're trying to recover your overhead, run it over the eight months that you're working. Even though if you run a snow removal business, um, I don't run. So my overhead recovery is based solely on my landscaping season. Um, it's not based on my snow removal because anything can happen in the winter, um, depending on how you work your contracts, but run it over your eight months that you work. Um, so I think it's just looking at that, looking at, you know, how much have you done in the past in sales? How much do you generally do on week? Um, how many billable hours are in a week? How many employees do you have? So how much money can you possibly generate in revenue? Subtract your overhead, subtract what investments you plan to make that year. What's, what's your buffer left with? And that kind of lets you know, what can you actually invest in? Um, so that's what I've looked to guide me in the last two years. Um, so yeah, that's the way, that's the way we do things. Definitely. And same question to you over there, Tony, debt versus no debt. Where do you stand? What is too much debt at your, in your business? Where do you, what is your thoughts on all this? Uh, well, obviously, like I said, I mean, it's 10 years that I've been in the, um, well, that Zamco has been open that I've uh, started Zamco. Um, we were horribly in debt at the beginning uh, on, as a startup, it was uh, very tough. Um, I think I, I said this in our podcast uh, as well. I started this company with a $20,000 line of credit. Um, and that was just to put the minimal down payments on machinery for uh, leases and financing and whatever we had to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, we I had to crawl out of that. And at the beginning, without having a, a name or reputation, I think it was extremely tough. Um, my, my wife takes care of all of our paperwork now. <laughs> I was doing all that as well. Uh, and that was, it. that was just, it wasn't, uh, my forte. That's not what I was good at. Right. And I, I, I learned that a bit too late on, but, um, um, now my wife is the type that hates that my suppliers love me because they, it doesn't make sense. They literally called me and said, Hey, you know, tell your wife to hold up on the check because there's a credit that I have to apply. And I need to do that before she sends a check. I'm like, dude, the check's already sent. Like <laughs> you're, so um, not to say we, we don't have debt. Uh, I don't uh, give an example. Um, my, my, I bought a six wheeler, um, an F550 at the beginning of last season. I obviously put that on uh, finance, right? I'm not going to go and spend a hundred thousand dollars on a truck. There's no logic in it. I could do a lot more with that money in the meantime than just buy that one piece of equipment. So there's good debt and then there's bad debt. If you're, 
like Mike said, if you have a plan for that piece of equipment, then by all means, go for it. If you have a plan. Um, I, I will not buy anything on finance, uh, finance or lease if I, as a, um, a, a spare, so to say, oh, it's an extra piece of equipment. I have an extra skid steer at the yard. I have a, an excavator I don't use, but they're paid, right? Like I sub out my excavation. I still own my excavator. I still own the, the, the dump truck. I still own all these things. Um, I don't need them, but if I need them, they're there, but they're also paid. I could not not use them, see them there, and make a payment every month that would make me sick. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I got out of snowmobile this year. I was paying for tractors the year round that uh, it's utterly useless to me in the in the summer. Not It is useless to me in the summer. They would stay parked. When I would have to take them out, they would have weeds growing through the wheels and all that. It was insane. I'm like, I, I'm paying an absorbent, uh, sorry, absorbent amount of money for these machines that are literally becoming trees. And uh, that's like that debt I didn't agree with, mm -hmm. right? So I got out of it. That was my decision. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that every business should have debt. I mean, if you could run a business, um, you know, of a certain size with no debt, then I take my hat off. I would love to see how that's possible. But as long as your debt is good debt, I don't think it's a problem. And as long as you can maintain that debt, right. you know what I mean? Don't buy equipment just because you have credit. That, that's, that's, I think a big thing. The banks will throw credit at people. Doesn't mean that you deserve it, <laughs> you know? So, so it comes down to that. Um, for me, if I'm buying a piece of equipment that I don't have a specific plan for, I have to have the money in the bank to buy it or else I will not go forward and do that. Excellent answers, guys. And I've got a quick speed round that I want to go through with you guys. Uh, I'll ask the question. I'll uh, name you and then just give your quick answer. And then we'll just go around with each and one of these. And starting with uh, what goes into your Tim Hortons coffee? Starting with Mike. Two sugar because I want the street cred for drinking black coffee. <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> Regular one cream, one sugar. Tony. Two milks, no sugar. I'm sweet enough. <laughs> uh, plastic edge restraint or concrete edge restraints. Jordan. Recently transitioned to concrete edging unless it's a gator-based patio, gator-based uh, rigid or flex edge restraint with the wedge anchors. They charge an arm and a leg for those screws, but they're worth every dollar. That It's really good. Tony. Uh, I use uh, plastic when it's uh, densely graded, and if it's an open an open graded, I obviously use a concrete uh, edge restraint. Or if I run out of plastic edge restraint, I will go to a concrete edge restraint. Uh, Mike, uh, we use con we transitioned this year to using concrete edge restraint. Unless Got it's it. the, then we use the gator edge and the plastic mm -hmm. edge and the screws. Uh, favorite piece of equipment in your business, equipment or tool, favorite piece in your business right now, Tony. Oh my God. You jumped right into me for that one. <laughs> piece of equipment? I love, I love my tools. Like, I can't, yeah, really. I can't, I can't one. <laughs> you know I mean? um, favorite piece of equipment. I don't know. I, I, I really do, um, love my skid steer, but if you want to say favorite piece of equipment owned by the company i have to say it's that new 48 f1 that i picked up so <laughs> not that it's useful but it's my favorite <laughs> it's, a, it's a marketing truck so it is technically a piece it's a marketing tool so it is a tool. gotcha yeah okay. i'd say my skid steer my skid steer I, I could spend hours in that nice uh mike uh for me it's the uh, triathlon dump truck whenever christy pulls away and that our tailgate has the big paper king symbol on the back it just it makes me feel like uh it reminds me of a different time in my life, and it makes me feel uh, it makes me feel like we're we made it somewhere or something. I don't know. I don't know why. I just I love the truck. Uh, it's it can be painful at times, but uh, I love it. it just, that's my favorite thing that we have. Nice. I have to say, Mike, I love I love that sticker on the back of your truck. Oh yeah, yeah. like I love it when when you posted it once. I'm like that is so badass, and that you did it like gray on gray. It's like yeah. if you know, you know. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. It you was awesome, know, bro. Absolutely, man. It yeah. was awesome. <laughs> Ever gray dump truck I see on the road. I'm like, oh, is that Chrissy? <laughs> <laughs> but then there's a little telltale, so you can tell if it is or not. 
Nice. And uh, Jordan, yourself? Um, it's got to be our enclosed trailer. Um, that 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 makes us a lot of money, keeps us organized, and saves us a ton of time. Don't forget things. But recently, we just bought a 550 with the dump box. First time having one of those, so I don't know. That, that thing might take it over this year. We'll see how that goes. Oh, it's a game changer. It's, yeah. it's, <laughs> I can only imagine. Uh, it's just a necessity. <laughs> it's literally the go-to for everything is that that six-wheeler dump truck. Yeah. It, yeah, gets, lo- it gets a beat. Looking forward to it. I feel bad for it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure we're going to use it, but uh, as long as it makes us money, that's that's a, that's the important part. Always. How many decks are you going to build this year? Jordan. Oh, <laughs> my cover years. <laughs> I have three booked right now. <laughs> I have three booked right now. A couple of privacy walls and stuff like that, but they all have patios. They all have patios with them. There's no sole decks this year. They do have patios. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> um, I don't build any decks um i don't actually have any even in subcontract uh, so far this year but there will be more wood um being integrated into my projects this year so not necessarily decks but i there will be more wood integrated into my projects and mike uh my plan is always to build zero decks absolutely zero we have one project where it's a mix between a deck it's a toss-up but i am working very hard every day to build zero decks <laughs> No, no decks never paid my mortgage, bro. <laughs> Fight for the cause, Mike. Absolutely. <laughs> Anyone, you know who to call, Mike. <laughs> I think I gave you a deck this year. I know. <laughs> I crushed I it. it. I sent it to you. Like, yeah. oh, bro, I'm not building it. That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, man. Um, what is the most Canadian thing that you do? Mike, start, you, start off with you. Uh, most Canadian thing I do, uh, I say the word, I say A a lot. I do. Um, that's probably pretty Canadian. Uh, I, I guess, I guess that's it for me. I say the word, I say A a lot. Um, yeah, that would be me. Tony, over to you. Uh, I drink like three, four Tim coffees a day. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's pretty Canadian. Um, and I guess I'm nice to people that don't deserve it. So that's pretty, that's pretty neat. <laughs> I like that one. I wasn't even thinking about that. <laughs> we're, we're just kind people. What are you going to say? Yeah. Uh, Jordan, yourself. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I wasn't even thinking about that, Tony. But, uh, yeah, I say sorry way too much. And I'm way too nice to people. But at the end of the day, I'm just a hockey player. I grew up playing hockey. I'm a hockey player. So it's just in my blood that's who i am i think hockey is canadian and <laughs> position you play jordan i played center Sorry. i didn't say i was very great at it but i played it play competitive just, just too short too skinny <laughs> <laughs> i think jordan saying that at one point he had just a whole hockey team working as his heart skin right it's probably the most canadian thing said <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. That was a company I worked for. But, uh, yeah, it was our whole hockey team, basically. It was, uh, yeah, I strive for that. I'm, I'm just waiting to find that hockey player that's, like, buddies with everyone and wants to bring all of his hockey buddies in. You start putting up signs at the arenas. Honestly, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are you most proud of in your business? What's that thing? that you are just the most proud of that has come into your business that you've built in your business or that you've purchased for your business? Tony. Um, You know what? I can't say it's a specific thing. It's our name. Uh, I'm proud of my business as a whole. Uh, And, and everybody that's everything that everyone's done uh, to get us where we are. Um, I'm, I'm proud of the logo. I'd have to say I, I wear it with pride and, there's not one specific piece of equipment that makes up the company. It's really the company as an entity by itself that, uh, that, that, that I makes everything worth it. Right. But, um, reputation name that that's what I'm most proud of. Jordan. 
Um, I'm proud of where we came from. Uh, I mean, we didn't have a, the easiest time getting going. Um, but at the same time, we always built things with quality. Uh, we never tried to cut corners just because we were losing on a job because I had lost on jobs. I mean, we won big on some, but lost on others for our own mistakes, but we've always ate them. We've never come back to clients for money um, on mistakes that we've made. So just being honest with people, uh, doing things the right way, uh, being loyal to our customers and, um, you know, just where we came from and where we are now. I mean, it's, uh, it's fun to look back. I mean, I, on my fridge, I have every single one of our business cards that we've ever had. Um, and it's just kind of a constant reminder of like where we came from and where we are now. So I'm, I'm just proud of where we're going and hopefully we continue to move in the, the same direction that we have. And Mike. Uh, if you know me for a long time, you'll know that I had a business that um, the business did well. I wasn't good at life and my whole life imploded around me and uh, ended up living at Tim Hortons and um, losing every, not losing any long story. Anyways, my whole life imploded and it took me, um, 10 years to put all my pieces back together. And uh, I think that I'm, I'm proud that after um, 10 years, I had still had people like Kaz who would, uh, you know, I just called him and said, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this again. And he was like, yeah, let's go right now. And Brian jumped on board with me immediately and stood up to help me. And um, I'm proud that, you know, all of our uh, Lucas and Jay and, and Christy would all um, trust me with their lives, um, you know, because uh, I was very good at business before and very bad at life. So I think that um, over the past 18 months, I'm, I'm proud that I, I hope that I'm better at life than I was before. Um, so I think that that's the thing I'm most proud of is that we're, uh, there was still people around me that were willing to um, you know, work together and, and create something that we could all be proud of. So that's my, uh, put my, put my life back together. You know, I recently said that I, I built a business and it imploded. And then I work at a business where I built a residential division where everyone knows me from and knows all the, a lot of our, uh, our work from. And then that imploded. And now I'm building this one. So when this one implodes, hopefully, you know, Jordan will give me a job and I can pick up a piece of it. <laughs> <laughs> I it's not going really like to happen. It's not going to so, you know, <laughs> like that's, anyway, that's what I'm, I'm proud that, you know, I think it was a testament to um, that we uh, everyone would, trust each other enough to, to move forward together because it's always a risky venture. And um, for all those people to, and especially my my wife, Kelly, to support me, um, you know, because she doesn't come from a business background. She's always worked in nonprofit industries and uh, to trust me with our lives, really, and everything that it, we had put together in 10 years, that's what I'm proud of. That's amazing. Excellent. Awesome. And as we bring this interview to a close, I have one last question for you guys, but I just want to say thank you for the time that you've already invested into this, that you've invested into the industry to get this information out there to, you know, make people getting into this industry, their, their lives better in terms of, you know, just hearing this information and being able to apply it to when they do start their business. Uh, you guys have already been here with me for two hours, 15 minutes plus the initial interview. So I do just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And with that, my final question is, what are you struggling right now in your business? What is that struggle that you are experiencing? Because no matter where we are in our business, there's always going to be those struggles. And the more that we talk about them, the more that we let the audience know listening to this, as well as people around us know, they can kind of make moves at least in their business to prepare themselves for these struggles because business is not all just sunshine and rainbows. So what is that struggle that you are experiencing right now in your business? Jordan, can we start with you with this one? For sure. Um, you guys got another hour? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a couple of things. Um, I mean, I'm always looking to improve. Like I'm never, I'm never satisfied until I really, you know, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to hit that point where I'm like fully, fully 100% satisfied. Uh, I always, it's just been the type of person I am to keep driving forward. But um, to answer your question, I mean, 
like there's a couple things. So employees, I mean, I'm trying to build that company culture that I touched on. Um, I would really love to have, you know, anywhere from two to five people that I know 100% I can rely on every single day. Um, and they're going to do the type of work that I want to do. And also, you know, we're all going to have a good time and enjoy doing it. Um, two, um, estimating. I mean, everyone always, you know, that's why I'm doing those things with Derek and tracking, you know, how long certain types of projects take us, how long every single aspect of the project takes us. It's not just like, this project has 250 billable hours on it. Did we reach 250 billable hours? Like it's not as simple as that stuff on LMN. Um, it's going through and it's my, my, my partner tracking how long did excavation take us for this type of project with this type of access and with this type of base, how long did filling take us? How long did grading take us? How long did this take us? And I want to start having that filing folder that I can go through and say, okay, this is a comparable job so that, you know, from now on, I'm not just almost leaning on, obviously leaning on my experiences, but at the end of the day, you're guessing, right? Until you have that track record and until you have that record of everything that you've done and that you can compare to, at the end of the day, you're guessing um, as far as labor goes, right? Unless you're charging square foot, but I just, I mean, I'm not going to get into that, but I really want to have that for sure set mindset that, you know, when I submit a job, I know for sure that I submitted the right job. I'm not overcharging. I'm not undercharging. I'm charging what I need to charge. Um, and I'm somewhat competitive, but still, I know I'm, I'm guiding myself to a niche market. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's that. I mean, at the end of the day, um, also, I mean, I, I want to build my business to the point where I'm not in the office. I want to be on site. So um, those are the things that I struggle with. And how do I get to that point? How do I let go of the soother or the baby bottle? Um, how do I hand it off to someone else to do my quoting where I feel like I need to have these processes in, in place for me to be able to say, you know what, you can quote my jobs. You can look at my jobs. You can design my jobs. Um, it's, it's getting to that point. So um, those are the things that, you know, I'm still working on and, you know, yeah, that's where I'm at. And Jordan, just a side note, what, what uh, software are you using to quote or to estimate right now? Uh, paper and pen. Yeah. I, I write everything out paper and pen. Um, I'm not a big Excel guy. I, I've tried having people put stuff together for me, but like, try and maybe I just haven't found the right person to kind of put that forward for me to, you know, say, this is how I want my stuff to look because I have explained to people, I want it to look this way. I want to have drop down menus here and I want to have price options here and I want to have this and I want to have that. Um, but for me, I just find it, you know, every job's different. I'll say that I need all these different categories in there and then something else will come up, you know, like um, just something, something random that, I will do because we can do it per se. Right. Uh, so yeah, I just find paper and pen right now works for me. Um, it takes me a lot of time. So that's why I'm spending more time pre-qualifying people um, so that I'm not doing an absurd amount of quotes. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I think that's works for me right now. Again, technology, I'm not the most techie person. Um, I can, you know, manage it, but um yeah, for me, it's, you know, right now, you know, me and my business partner, we put together sheets in the off season where it's just a basic word document with tables and it's got all every single process for all the jobs that are booked um, and how many billable hours that I have billed for that job, for that aspect of the job, because I've broken it down to excavation is going to take us 24 man hours at, you know, three guys at so much dollars per hour. Right. Um, so it's for him, you know, at the end of the day to fill in, you know, know so many people worked on this aspect of the job for this many hours then I can compare those things and say you know I was right or I was wrong um, but that's really one thing I really want to hone in on is making sure and you know, we slipped last year and doing it and it was our goal last year but we've really you know pushed to make it happen this year so um, yeah just making sure that we know where are we making money where are we not making money and what, how do I have to quote certain jobs and how do I know that they're quoted accurately? Excellent. And over to you, Mike, struggle in your business. Uh, I think it, for us, you know, for me in general, I have an obsession with keeping everyone happy. Um, 
you know, and I think that that's going to be a struggle for us in the upcoming year. Our, our biggest client is very busy already, um, you know, and that's a valuable client to us. And we have residential work, and I feel like our um, our trucking business is expanding to the point where we need two trucks. Uh, you know, our our residential crew could we could run one crew full time, and I know we could run at least one crew um, commercially full time for our. our um, for our biggest client, Joe from Sightscape. So, um, you know, I think for me, I'm looking in the spring and I'm just intimidated by how are we going to keep all these people happy? You know, like, I, I, you know, keeping your clients happy and keeping, maintaining your level of service that we've always given them. Um, I think another struggle, and, you know, I say often, there's two types of people, and Jordan will tell you, I say this all the time, there's two types of people that own landscaping businesses. There's business people that happen to own a landscaping business and there's landscapers that happen to own a business. Um, I think we can all say that I'm a landscaper that happens to own a business. I am not a business person. And so I, I think that for me, um, you know, trying to maintain that, that I'm a landscaper first is going to be a struggle as the business grows um, more than I had ever anticipated. So I think that those are you know, and like I said earlier, I'm extremely intimidated with hiring someone that's uh, outside of my my um, group of people. But uh, I feel like that's going to be we're either going to have to take that step, or we're going to just have to say it's the five of you know the six of us, um, well seven you know, with Kelly in the office, and we're going to have to roll forward with that if we're if I'm not willing to go outside the the box to hire someone I don't know. So uh, those those are sort of our struggles. It's also you know I joke around about it, but our age is a struggle for us. Um, you know, we're old and like I have carpal tunnel so bad in my hand, I can't hold the saw, I switch hands when I'm cutting with a saw constantly because I, uh, I can't close my hand on my goalie stick if I'm playing um, for a full hour. So I think, and we all, all of us are old and we all have different things going on. Um, so, you know, definitely watching and maintaining our uh, physical fitness of our crew. Um, you know, that's, I try to find work that's, uh, you know, well adapted to that, um, that situation and maybe maybe we need to expand the excavating size of our bit side of our business a bit more because that uh, I feel like that's not as physically intense as um, as necessarily hardscaping or maybe we need to invest in more uh, more equipment more vacuum equipment um, you know so those are those are things we're considering now if we're at a I started this business it was supposed to just be um, just me and Kaz just the two of us um, doing small jobs trying to uh, maybe close a we opened a chapter that got slammed closed in my life too early. Uh, and then it sort of grown into this much larger thing we got going on. So, you know, I hadn't had plans for that. So we are currently working on budgets and um, plans and stuff like that, trying to figure, Kelly and I are working hard trying to figure out um, where we want to go and how we're, literally how we can maintain our high level of client service. That's our biggest struggle right now. Excellent answer. And over to you, Tony, close things out. What is your struggle in your business? Um, our struggle, I have to say, is really a schedule based um, schedule, um, not just schedule, I would say more the structure of the of the company itself. Um, I take on a lot that, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm slowly like teaching, learning to delegate. I'm not teaching, I'm learning to teach. I am learning to delegate work that I have a lot of trouble um, giving off. I was lucky enough to that my brother could take on sales because that's something that I could never give to a salesman. I don't trust someone else. I told you I'm very proud of my brand. I don't trust putting that in someone else's name. So delegating is a big struggle for me, something that I definitely have to work on, but also a structure of the, of the company itself. Uh, when I say schedule, uh, in that sense, is that, like I said, we're we're blessed to have a, a lot of work lined up for this coming season, but it's it, it's not necessarily a good thing, right? It it means that great, we have the work that that's fantastic, but the, all this work has to be built, and we don't want to be un uh, unaccessible to to we don't want to be close to all the potential work that would normally come to us in the month of march or or january even february whatever it is um at this point these are all contracts that we would have signed anyway and we're losing them and i have a big problem with um not you know like the, the f uh, fear of missing out 
You know, it's more like, oh, that project could have been awesome. You never know what project you're turning down. You never know what feature you're not going to build because you didn't have the time, uh, which brings me to the expansion. I've, we do a lot of work and, and nobody believes that we have one crew, but we have one crew. It's a big crew, but we have one crew. Um, and that makes it easy for me to be on site. Once we split, that will not be a possibility anymore. I'll be on site all the time, but which site? And I think that's a big thing. And that's why I'm actually working on uh, software right now because it's, I mean, at the end of the day, our, our world is very technology based now and there are a lot of tools out there at our disposal. Uh, it's just got to get used to using them. Um, and I'm, I'm technology, but I'm not like to that extent. Right? So um, I want to have, I'm going to have a whole program put together, which once this gets up and running and everything, and if it works well, I'm definitely gonna start sharing it with, with landscapers and give them the opportunity, uh, more like a team management software uh, that's gonna have a, a punch clock integrated in it. Obviously it's very simple that, but it's gonna, it's basically cloud-based. I mean, there's our, there are programs like this, like Google Drive and all this stuff, um, but it's gonna be more tailored to my company. And if we can make things more hardscape based, it'd be pretty awesome. But um, it's going to have a punch clock. It's going to have a cloud-based uh, system where they'll be able to send me pictures, videos constantly without it just being on my phone. That way, it's not just me. It's I could send it off right away to that team leader, you know, or, or vice versa, or whatever the case is. Um, inventory of things, too. I want to have a lot of that in there. So that my struggle is, is managing the growth of the business uh, in a way that doesn't impact um, the possibilities of growth, right? Not to be scared of the growth, but to adapt to it. And I think adapting to it is scary and, and it's hard. It's, it's hard to, uh, to make the right decision when this is all un un like the, the untreaded water for me. You know what I mean? So I think that's our biggest struggle right now. Excellent. Well, guys, that brings us to the end of our episode. I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this once more. We're just going to go around any closing comments, anything you want to leave the audience with and let us let everybody know where they can find you online, wherever you want to direct them to, to find out more about yourself, your businesses, starting back with you, Tony, Tony, uh, closing comments, remarks, anything you want to leave them with and where can they find you? Uh, well, I am Tony Zambito, owner of Group Zamco, uh, Group Zamco, because of French, not Group A Zamco, as people say. <laughs> um, uh, and you could find us at uh, Group Zamco on Instagram, and that's Group with an E at the end, which we might drop, but for now it's Group with an E at the end, uh, Zamco, Z A M C O. And on Facebook, obviously, uh, at Group Zamco Inc. Um, and that's it. And we're, this year we're going to be opening a, uh, or starting a YouTube channel as well, like I said earlier. So stay tuned for that. I don't know what's going to be on it yet, but uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. It's going to be very educational. So we're hoping to help out a lot of, uh, startup, uh, contractors with that. Awesome. And going over to you, Jordan. Yeah, uh, I'm Jordan, uh, and I am part owner of DPR Landscapes. Um, you can find us at DPR Landscapes on Instagram, DPR Landscapes on Facebook. Uh, this year, I love to be a little bit more active on Instagram um, and Facebook basically the same thing but um also i just want to reach out you know if there's anyone out there that's young um needs any like simple advice i've already talked to two guys since the i am a hardscaper that have reached out to me and talked to me um so if there's anyone else out there that you know wants to reach out about starting a business from square one um and you know any way I feel you feel that I can help, uh, I'd be happy to help you and take the time to, to walk you through some simple steps, some little things that I made mistakes on that um, I can help you to make sure you don't make those mistakes. So uh, feel free to reach out. Um, even though I don't post all the time on Instagram, I am on it. Uh, so if you DM me, I will get back to you. Awesome. And close us out there, Mike. Uh, so you can find us at Paver King, at basically everywhere. I just want everyone to know that recently we started a, a Paver King OnlyFans. So if you might want to go check that out. It's, uh, it's got some <laughs> that we don't everywhere else. Um, you know, we also recently started a, a Paver King MySpace. So, you know, it's going to go to all audiences. That still um, exists. I want to give a shout out to Mike for putting together the first, uh, you know, 
all Canadian hardscape. I'm proud to uh, sit in with you four guys. It means a lot to me to be a part of it. Um, and then, you know, for us, uh, you can find us basically anywhere at Paver King. Um, you know, and I, and if you DM me and you want to know something, I'm the most brutally honest person in the world. So if you're looking for an honest opinion on something, send me a DM. I'm always happy to get back to anyone uh, and reach out. And, you know, our business is, is uh, an open book. So someone wants to know something about our business, I'm happy to tell them about it. Um, you know, so reach out anytime at Paver King uh, and, you know, strike first, strike hard and then <laughs> for 2021. And <laughs> and thank you for listening to today's episode of the How to Hardscape podcast. Visit us at howtohardscape.com for more information. And thank you to our guests. Be sure to check them out on Instagram. Follow each and every one of them. They put in on a lot of time into this. Two and a half hours each. We're at 248, something like 11 man hours into this episode. So get definitely give them a follow for that and show them some love. Uh, subscribe to us, leave us a rating or an review on your podcast. You can watch this on YouTube also if you want to see everybody's faces and, and check us out there, How to Hardscape. Once again, uh, we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast. Awesome, guys. That's it. That was awesome. Yeah, that was great. That was, that was a lot of fun, guys. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks, Mike.